reason there is no doubt if it is not that another reason it is why that's all that's all you try to make out so why diastolic it will end you know in first sound so this is very simple if you regularly practice so here i think the jugular venous pressure is very high elevated which means we expect right atrium to be you know enlarged even rv enlarged that you will see we expect that but we don't know maybe having tricuspid regurgitation but you said a wave is more prominent so i doubt you know very much so let us see the you know, rest of the presentation then regarding we'll... regarding the jvp i will suggest some modification jugular venous pressure is elevated 10 cm above the clavicle a wave more prominent than the b wave will uh, invite some questions because normally a wave is more prominent than the b wave on the right side yes so that doesn't convey much whether it is abnormally prominent you have to tell so normally a is more prominent then and the, if the problem game b wave with normal inspiratory fall no jugular venous pressure is elevated 10 cm above the angle of clavicle with a normal inspiratory fall sir a and b wave same x and y is in same so a wave is uh, unduly prominent you sir if there is a prominent a wave don't say a wave is more prominent than the b wave because that is normal we want to know whether it is abnormally prominent or <laughs> prominent you have to say the second thing is there is a question which i would like to modify a little bit x design is it a systolic or diastolic uh, if um, i am asked to answer sir x design has two components one is the x before the c and the x prime which is after the c after the, the x which is before the c is the descending limb of the a wave which is a diastolic one but the main part of the x descent is the x prime after c wave which is a early systolic event okay that is the way you have to discuss you will face so many questions on jp so you should be extremely careful the way you are presenting jugular venous pressure is elevated 10 cm above the clavicle with normal inspiratory fall there is no need to do hepatojugular reflex in these situations that sir a and b wave seen x and y is unseen so a wave is prominent when you say a wave is prominent that means it is abnormally prominent okay that is the way you have to present but not like a more prominent than b wave then they will ask you what is what is the normal pattern what is in left atrium why it is different all those things okay read about jvp also what is given in bronwald is enough more than enough okay go ahead they must also have an idea of what is normal a wave in how much you know right side usually about 5 and 6 and the left side it is you know 10 and 12 that sort of See, this is a usual description which all candidates give a wave more than prominent that is that is for normal when you take a good inspiration the pressure mean pressure falls that is agreed that is inspiratory fall physiologically correct but the waves are better seen because mm -hmm. always back on, on inspiration you can see the waves better though the pressure falls so then you can find uh, the hair just flickering it's a little more healthy it's not the, the usual description no that is for normal not for this case so precordium precordial examination Model examination: shape of the chest normal, symmetrical. Surgical scar of mastectomy seen over the left. Chest is symmetrical. Chest is symmetrical with the mastectomy on the left side. No sir, not symmetrical. Huh? There is a mastectomy on the left side. Yeah. So see, this is a normal presentation you are doing. You know, hundreds of cases may be presenting. You know, so shape is bilateral. Bilateral symmetrical also not required. Symmetrical is bilateral. So shape. Or oh, the chest normal, you cannot say. Yeah. Okay, fine. I mean the thoracic cage and other things. Not yeah, just... yeah. You meant that we agree, but you know. Mm. No, we are little critical for your benefit. You don't mind that, no? Because we are only trying to correct your statements. Okay, sir. No scar, no sinuses or fistula. Yeah, it's just for like this stage, you know. Yeah, it should have been first, I think. You know, that all goes in the general examination. You come to the shape. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Pythal impulse felt in the left fifth intercostal space, one centimeter lateral to the midclavicular line. I think it is an LV type of apex. Okay. I think uh, when you say LV type. 
before that you have to say what is a character is it a normal yeah. tapping forcible or heaving or sustain uh, then we may ask is it lv type or rv type but it makes a difference uh, because uh, in if you are dealing with uh, lv dysfunction due to dilated cardiomyopathy or any situation where there is a lv uh, dominance a sustained effects beat indicates two things one there is an obstruction to flow or it is taking a longer time because the apex outward bulge is mainly contributed by the isometric contraction and early part of systolic ejection so when there is lv systolic dysfunction the pre ejection period or the isovolumic contraction period will be prolonged that is the time during which the apex is coming out so in a patient with myocardial disease like coronary artery disease or dilated cardiomyopathy if the apex is sustained that indicate that he has severe lv systolic dysfunction because the isometric contraction time is too much prolonged so a sustained apex beat occurs when there is a prolonged isometric contraction time or a prolonged early ejection time as in aortic stenosis or a prolonged isometric contraction time or the pre ejection period as in lv systolic dysfunction so you have to tell that and then you can say it is an lv type of it. but those characters normal tapping forcible heaving should be said and then you can add that it is lv or rv type whatever it is okay go ahead so in this uh, she had you know particularly she, she should have look for paras channel she is coming to that sir huh? she is coming to that we have i have talked her at the lv apex elevated jvp of this nature it will be very unlikely that uh, there is no parasternal movement i don't know whether jvp is correct or uh, she didn't come to that sir imagine that the par you know left parasternal area is absolutely normal without so this may have uh, you know even epigastric pulsation if 10 cm above the clavicle as a gross elevation of venous pressure so it will have its own uh, some signs so if it is not there particularly you can say you know right we are not able to examine the patient and the say whether the jvp is elevated to this extent she okay. has come only to the apex beat now okay next yeah, the apex she came to apex right you know ah. did not no mention pulse. anything about the pulsation visible in the epigastric or suprasternal area but but uh, you know always you must also look for pulsation in the second space left to second space because that gives with the especially right sided failure here you know with the jvp whether the pulmonary artery is dilated whether it is you know giving any pulsation when you very carefully tangentially look and there may be pulsation in the second in the causal space that also should be looked for very carefully epigastrium also very carefully so if it is not there well it's good so then the jvp becomes questionable right and lv finally what it is sustained or uh, what is it lv lv apex is it forceful normal or is it sustained sustained means more sustained than sustained lv apex sustained lv apex okay okay so you are almost uh, coming to okay, sustained fine okay let's see whether you can so next right. slide next slide next no next pulsations slide. visible in the epigastric and suprasternal okay uh, not enough i think that's not enough so you have to say inspection and palpation combined apex beat is seen and felt in the fifth lift and all those things so there is no left parasternal heave no epigastric pulsation there are no pulse in the second space second sound is not palpable there are no suprasternal pulsations these things you have to tell okay these all the you have to you have to complete that because as in the first case we said we want to know what is the left ventricle what is the right ventricle what is the pulmonary artery what is the pulmonary artery pressure what are the arteries like all those things definitely you have to tell then coming to the percussion to pick up right atrial enlargement or pericardial effusion percussion is very important in this case also okay go ahead next slide yes. uh, the left heart border corresponds to apex right heart border corresponds to right sternal border resonant not heard over right and left sacral intercostal space liver dullness noted in right fifth intercostal space in mid clavicular line as in the earlier case we said that uh, start with liver dullness then only you can go for the right border second as sir said uh, jvp is grossly elevated so we expect a right atrial enlargement so percussion will be concentrating on the right atrium 
so that you should be a little careful we don't bother very much about percussion nowadays but in this case the percussion is important because one of the different diagnoses in a patient with malignancy is pericardial effusion so that also is very important but we don't give too much significance on percussion we just compromise on percussion okay fine go ahead auscultation sir s1 is normal s2 a2 and p2 heard normal split and normal respiratory variation no sc or s4 heard no additional heard sound additional sounds heard in systole and diastole no significant murmurs heard what murmurs did you specifically look for dr sirisha knowing the history knowing the examination findings now you look for a murmur here in this patient mr sir functional mr murmur if it is uh, secondary mr murmur one any other murmur similarly same uh, suppose uh, because the most of the time dilated cardiomyopathy the process which involves both the ventricles okay so no, patient no. not only right heart failure but they still may have tr murmur also tr murmur tr murmur no normal no no murmur no murmur no finding no auscultatory abnormal finding very good yes uh, okay then i take that auscultatory findings auscultatory findings just to go through the auscultatory find cardiac is this what you expect that is the first question in a patient who has probably you are diagnosing a myocardial disease with severe left ventricular failure and congestive heart failure what will be the first sound like just answer that i am just asking your finding may be right but what is the likely first sound abnormality likely to be soft so yes yes so this is not like this what is likely to be second sound like a patient with a left heart disease gone in for right heart failure they are likely to have some degree of ph the ph is likely to be low that then what happens to the second S3. sound in sound split in myocardial disease going for right heart failure right heart failure the p2 can be delayed so you can have white split in left ventricular disease they can have lbb there you can have a paradoxical split Paradoxic. there is severe systolic dysfunction if it is there that again can produce paradoxical split so a combination of all these can produce even a single second sound so we are not expecting a normal first sound a normal second sound and when there is a rate of 102 which sir has highlighted because everything looks the patient is okay but 102 in a patient with heart failure in the absence of any other cause like thyrotoxicosis or fever or whatever it is there is a little unusual If a patient with heart failure has sinus tachycardia, we expect a diastolic sound, a third sound, because sinus tachycardia indicates that we have not stabilized the patient. The patient still has significant left ventricular dysfunction, so we expect a lot of auscultatory abnormalities in heart sounds. First sound we expect it to be soft, unless now you may be right, but you have to check again. Second sound with your history and other findings, I am not expecting a normal second sound. i am expecting an additional sound then you should carefully look for the mitral regurgitation murmur or a tr murmur during inspiration because jp is grossly elevated okay so those are things which you have to specifically look for okay okay sir now when there is no positive finding at all in auscultation the next step is what is the next step i'll tell you but you know you must be able to tell me Uh, dynamic auscultation. Yes, dynamic auscultation. If in this case you should do it, you know. So to bring out an S3, how do you look for an S3? What do you do to the patient? You are examining the patient S3 sitting is, only. S3 is better palpable than hurts. No, not better palpable than you know. It is not. So if it is palpable, it is hurt also S3. <laughs> So well, it is about uh, you know 500 to 800 uh, you know hertz only. So S3, S4, but S3 how will you look for in a patient? Suppose I ask you to examine this patient and tell me whether S3 is present or not. What will you do? Left lateral position. Yeah, left lateral position. Okay, lying down, left lateral position. Then back diaphragm of the stethoscope. You are not telling me yes or no. Yes, sir. Yes, you ask that the bell or diaphragm is asking you. I always mislead you. Sound. Bell or diaphragm. 
he agreed and i from <laughs> you should use the bell you know it is is it a high pitch sound or a low pitch sound they are all very fundamental then low you can excite the patient little bit you know sitting up and down you know in the bed itself you know little more you know exertion may bring out with the bell or the you know very you know softly applied exactly at the apex and look for it you may get a third heart sound you know similarly fourth heart sound also in this uh, particular case you should see right sided fourth heart sound is a very difficult to you know uh, it is usually not there unless rv is hypertrophied and enlarged and with failure but in this i think a jvp has uh, let us into a little problem here right i don't think it is that high or because it does not uh, correspond to this and heart is not enlarged also so dynamic auscultation then you can uh, what else can you do you must increase the peripheral resistance and see squatting used to be a method but just you know hand grip alone is enough so increase the peripheral resistance make the patient stand and see whether the murmur appears suppose he has metal valve prolapse and on standing he may find what happens to the murmur of uh, mitral regurgitation with mitral valve prolapse he said no additional sound no. So we take yes. it mm. what happens to the sound or what happens to the murmur on standing murmur will become decrease in intensity no just the opposite huh? it is not intensity you look for the ejection non ejection click becomes earlier and the murmur becomes longer on standing because lv becomes smaller basically the load will be decreased in standing standing yes so then you know is it a condition like hcm it does not look like it but you know then dynamic auscultation is absolutely important the nowadays we don't give amyl nitrate and all that but you should also know somebody some old examiner may you know all the people are nowadays not <laughs> they ask what is the effect of amyl nitrate when do we use it we have all used it you know so we know what happens so dynamic auscultation is very very important especially when you have murmur and sounds which are doubtful may be present may not be present everything looks normal you should look Okay, now dynamic exam. It is over now. I, so, I think dynamic. I would like to take up because one exam to give a question for the other examiner. There is a problem which happens in the examination. There are four examiners. I may get a question from uh, Doctor Nidin or Abraham sir. So I have got a question. Okay, regarding dynamic auscultation. In this case, which dynamic auscultation will you do? To see you now here there are no findings. You want to elicit findings. There is a problem. now there are certain findings you want to do dynamic auscultation to pick up the variation of those findings here you are not getting any findings so here it is to elicit the findings you should be careful one dynamic auscultation has very limited role in presence of congestive heart failure second we are not supposed to do many dynamic auscultation in presence of congestive heart failure so if you start like that say what about dynamic auscultation sir she is in congestive heart failure she is in class 3 so i may not be doing dynamic auscultation number one it is not advisable second thing when there is heart failure the dynamic auscultation doesn't produce additional benefits you will treat her but the simple thing which you can do is standing and lying down because okay. there is a simple thing which modifies the venous return so there is a thing which you can do all the other things have limitations then to here it is dynamic auscultation to pick up findings where third sound and fourth sound can be picked up so for third sound and fourth sound can be picked up as sir said by modifying the heart load which we may not try in presence of heart failure so these are some of the things which i want to contribute about dynamic auscultation and regarding dynamic auscultation you should try to get away at the earliest because it's a very difficult thing when you are not familiar we can ask so many questions okay <laughs> in dynamic auscultation if you go for the student sake i can tell you most of the examiners will bring you you know if you are so far done well they will ask you in this particular condition for example it is hcm okam they will ask you about the well cell lua maneuver without well cell lua maneuver it is difficult for a candidate to go through the examination at one stage or other you know it will hit you and it is 
not an easy thing to not a very easy thing to understand once you understand it is uh, it is very easy so you should know all about valsalva manner how it is done whether it is four stages what happens with each stage and what is the benefit and in fact we used to guess ejection fraction with valsalva manner yeah you know, so that sort of precision used to be there but nowadays those so things are dying down but you should know when you should do valsalva manner and when you can you know modify the findings Okay. Okay. So right. We have finished your finding. Next step. Next step is our di- you know discussion and diagnosis. Diagnosis. Other systems, yes, no. Nothing impressive. Nothing. Okay. Functional <laughs> diagnosis. Left heart failure, probably post chemotherapy induced in a sinus rhythm in my H A class three in C C F and no signs of infective endocarditis. The second cause would be uh, coronary artery disease. Ah. That is, you are, you are saying silent coronary artery disease, is not? Yeah. Because she has no angina, there is no symptom regarding that. But only breathless. Yeah, yeah, she may have diffuse coronary artery disease. We don't know. And also, uh, you know, what else is there? We are just coming to the differential diagnosis again. You know. Here again, for you, it will be a little difficult to tell the diagnosis. But um, I will put it like this: no signs of infective endocarditis you can avoid in this case because yes. whatever differential diagnosis you are entertaining, we are not entertaining endocarditis. Whereas the valvular heart disease or a lesion prone for endocarditis, you can put. I will tell you how I put the diagnosis. It will be difficult in the case, sir. This patient has. Uh, Uh, congestive heart failure due to left ventricular myocardial dysfunction the etiology i would like to discuss sinus rhythm nyha3 in congestive heart failure sinus tachycardia you have to say so the myocardial problem could be ischemic or non ischemic because so there is no volume or load no it could be no ischemic or non ischemic a diabetic i will consider ischemic as a possibility with a background of chemotherapy a chemotherapy induced myocardial dysfunction also i will consider that is the way i present because it is very difficult to say like rheumatic mitral disease or like that i will say congestive heart failure secondary to lb myocardial dysfunction it could be ischemic or non ischemic okay sinus tachycardia nyha class 3 congestive heart failure this is the way i put the diagnosis type 2 diabetes then you should look at the fundus to see whether there is any retinopathy you should look for nephropathy because we are uh, post graduation after md medicine so you have to say type 2 diabetes with no features of um, nephropathy or peripheral neuropathy i have not assessed the nephropathy aspect neuropathy you can ask for the symptoms so then we will give you more marks beyond cardiology you have looked into diabetes also because what we want to know is there is a microvascular involvement and your treatment especially when it comes to heart failure diabetes we are more interested in the treatment of this case also the presence of diabetes presence of ckd presence of microvascular disease all modifies the present day management of diabetes with heart failure or even without heart disease you know the newer drugs also so those things are important so don't be confined to cardiology if you put that also i will give you extra marks so my diagnosis will be sir congestive heart failure secondary to left ventricular failure myocardial problem ischemic or non ischemic cardiomyopathy Uh, sinus tachycardia nyha3 in chf type 2 diabetes without peripheral neuropathy without um, obvious retinopathy i have not assessed the nephropathy part that is the way i complete the diagnosis then the exam gets a feeling that this candidate will go into the comprehensive management of the the patient including the latest things in cardio diabetic syndromes very nice that's why it should be done very anyway. no when you put the professional diagnosis uh, you know nowadays suppose we find the notes of a patient in another hospital or another doctor sees we see only what is the treatment given and what is the diagnosis written so the diagnosis should be you know well written without mistake now in this particular case having given the you know high jvp and right sided failure here you have professional diagnosis you have put first as left heart failure So that should not be congestive cardiac failure. Secondary to left heart failure, or again in congestive cardiac failure it is coming. 
So that uh, left heart failure is uh, out of place here. Congestive cardiac failure. Secondary to left heart failure. So uh, this chemotherapy, are you saying that it will affect only the left ventricle? Why not the right ventricle? Most commonly left ventricular dysfunction, systolic dysfunction. I don't know. I don't know myself whether it uh, affects equally or in the what percentage right heart also. Right heart also has got uh, equal right to get affected, I think. I, by I know, sir. Uh, the problem is any systemic problem, uh, whether it is uh, therapeutic, iatrogenic or inflammatory, whatever it is, it is likely to affect the dominant ventricle. Except uh, the symptom, but right also can be affected. It can be affected, but yeah. predominantly so, it will be a left heart involvement. Except to certain other conditions like endomyocardial fibrosis, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, like that. But all the other diseases with systemic illness they are likely to affect the dominant ventricle primarily and the other ventricle also to a lesser extent. That's why they come with left heart symptom followed by right heart symptom. So biventricular involvement is well described in all these entities. Okay. In this patient, uh, JVP is elevated almost 10 centimeters above the yeah. clavicle. So there's definite right ventricular, right ventricular involvement yeah. there definitely. Yeah, we didn't definitely. have RGS3 and uh, we didn't have uh, parastinal pulsations and all. Probably I think we could go back and examine the patient for, to look for that. Yeah. Uh, problem. See what uh, JVP of 10 centimeters indicates right RV involvement also problem. Yeah, that's right. But we have to make sure that there is no PA. No, is, the, is the patient there? Where is the, you know, can uh, somebody, a senior person, look at the JVP and tell us what it is? And yeah, this is Dr. Dasagar. I have seen the patient. Oh. The blood pressure was markedly elevated. It is, um, and it is, uh, what do you call, there is no doubt that it was uh, more than uh, almost 10 centimeters above the uh, clavicle. What about the heart sounds? Heart sounds? And they have both the ways are seen. Uh, both the waves are seen and normal response to respiration and uh, additional sounds were not there. We so had normal. only, you know, or what do you call... Um, Any uh, pericardial knock? No pericardial knock, no pericardial gap. So what about the second and, sound, sir? Second sound, second heart sound? Second heart sound is normal. Normal no. in the sense, normal split. P2 is probably slightly louder than... Well, that is very. But then the problem here is that she had a left mastectomy, so it's slightly oh, that's a problem. Uh, difficult to, to say that P2 is that's loud or not. No, thin chest wall. So yeah, thin yeah. chest wall. Sririsha, that second sound is very important <laughs> because you know, come to the uh, discussion part is over. So is there only one point. Is just only one point. There is <laughs> when you get a severe right heart failure. The first thing we have to look is, is it pulmonary hypertensive or not? So that is the relevance of that second space, second yeah. sound, all those things. Is it a primary pulmonary, if there is PAH with right heart failure or without PAH? Mm -hmm. If there is no significant PAH, as uh, Dr. Nithin and Abraham sir said, it is a predominant biventricular involvement. Suppose there is pulmonary hypertension, we have to see what is the contribution by PA for right heart failure, what is the contribution by right ventricular myocardial dysfunction. So our evaluation should concentrate not only on left ventricle, PA pressure and right ventricular function evaluation, which is by all the investigation, including the simple ECG, X-ray, the echo and other imaging modalities. Okay. He must be having, you know, you know clinically not detectable, must be having mild pulmonary hypertension. Uh, definitely, definitely she will have yeah. pulmonary hypertension because what yeah. is the LV diastolic pressure in this case? Yeah, about 25 is pulmonary hypertension. Yeah. So what is the LV diastolic pressure in this case, Trisha? Yeah. LVDP, sir. LVDP is around 18 or 20. No, when there is proximal um. nocturnal dyspnea, orthopnea, the pulmonary capillary bed pressure is likely to be more than 25. 25. In chronic cases, it may be even higher. And the morning we said, in the absence of mitral stenosis, the pulmonary capillary pressure is equal to the LV diastolic pressure. So you have to say the LV diastolic pressure is likely to be at least 25 millimeters of mercury. Then she is orthopnic even now. She have examined in sitting position. Okay, go ahead. I think we are running out of time. Can we? Investigations. ECG, X-ray. What do you want? ECG or uh, X-ray? Can you just stop uh, sending the uh, Yes, sir. Oh, for all together, we will give her. If you are running out of time, running out yeah, of yeah. time, we can see. Tap, 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 whatever she yeah. wants. Uh, we'll just give her the data. First, give the X-ray. 
Yeah. So here we will decide and give it X ray. X ray, this is the one. X ray is not seen. Yeah. Any, you know, sometimes we'll find the pleural effusion, this, that, and you know. No, no, X ray is visible now? Not no. really. Not yet. <laughs> not yet. Good evening, Krishna Raju, sir. Good evening. Okay. Not is it visible now? Yeah. It's visible, but <laughs> not only visible, it is a little depressing also. <laughs> yeah. It is a little, you know, looks like uh, looks like uh, you know, some industrial pulmonary all over something. Like that. <laughs> Uh, yes, madam. What do you think? Is yes, this the X-ray no, which you expected, or you have to modify your findings, a diagnosis? <laughs> what is the most striking, unusual thing? There's no pulmonary venous. But most important is the heart size. What is yeah. the heart yeah. size? In yeah. this? No heart size. No cardiac. CT ratio appears to be normal. Okay, that is very unusual because. Six months history, we have picked up the effects beyond gross systemic venous congestion. We expected a larger heart with a larger right atrium. There are some limitations in the, the proper, um, it is not a properly exposed film, but still lack of cardiomegaly is very, very unusual with the diagnosis. Because with the diagnosis history, you expected left atrial environment, it is not impressive. Venous congestion, I can't comment. Okay. So, suppose this patient, everything, auscultation, everything is normal. Their heart size is normal. What is the likely diagnosis? No, he has RPA, you know, RPA looks, uh, is there peripheral pruning and, you know, we can miss pulmonary hypertension. And you have the X-ray again, it has gone out of. The cord yeah, is not, the cord no, is it, not that good. The descending branch of RPA looks like, uh, you know, see, it is prominent. <laughs> right, right. Uh, hilum. Right hilum appears to be slightly. Not, 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 not normal. Not happy to say normal, but I don't need to go more into this. Is it, it, looks, more, it looks more like a perihilar case yeah. rather than a yes. rather than a, yeah. The pulmonary vascularity is unimpressive. Heart size is normal. I can see the left bronchus which is coming straight down. I expect a left atrial environment. I can't comment about the SVC shadow. My question is, does this EC X-ray belong to this patient who have presented or something else? Because... Uh, 100, no, no. Now, I will belongs 100% to her. Uh, <laughs> one thing, there is no left breast shadow. So, this X-ray belongs to the same yeah, patient. Exactly. Right breast shadow is there. So, this exactly. X-ray belongs to the same. These are some yeah. of the questions that is asked. Then there is a cardiomegaly with absence of breast shadow. You think of CA with pericardial effusion. Okay, fine. Go ahead. Show the EC. Yeah, okay. Uh, 12 lead 4 channel ECG, sir, showing. Uh, is the ECG seen? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. It's seen. Not all the. Yeah. yeah. What is the axis? Axis here is around plus 60 degrees, sir. Three, I cannot see. Hmm. Yeah. So how is it positive or? Yeah, appears to be 60. Plus 60 there. degrees, sir. Frontal yeah. plane QRS axis. Uh, there seems to be LVH, sir. Do you think this is a healthy pulmonary disease? Is it transition to poor RV progression also? Is it? Is it compatible with your diagnosis of a left ventricular myocardial disease, or you have to bring in some other diagnosis? X-ray is odd. But this ECG is compatible with your diagnosis of something like an LV myocardial disease. Yes, sir. Left. Yes. What is the point? ECG is compatible with the in the sense that there are good LV forces LV pressure LV overload that. and T wave changes in the lateral leads, indicating if that primarily there is a left ventricular myocardial problem. You should look into the QT interval in these types of cases because it says its own implications. You have to look into the QRS width, QRS fragmentation, all those things. You should know what are the things you should look in the ECG in a patient with myocardial disease. Okay. No, no, this patient is special. Because, no, 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 because there is no left breast. Does that influence your voltage? 
Uh, it uh, theoretically should. Yeah. It is. Yeah. But the dominance is it a left hand no, no, no. dominance? Point here is. Point here is the candidate should make it a point that although yeah. there is evidence of LVS by voltage, it may be spurious because there is left mass spectrum. Yeah. Okay. But it does not. Uh, it does not rule out. It does not rule out. Is, is, is PR, PR segment in uh, AVR any significance? PR segment, pericarditis, that sort of. Pericarditis. PR segment. Oh, yeah. Elevation. Elevation. Segment. Elevation. Elevation. Yeah. No, clinically there is no clinically there is no pericardial. Problem. No, no. Okay. The ST segment in tail waves, Dr. Sirisha. No, the ST segment in tail waves, V5, V6, V4, V5, V6. Yes, sir. There's a slight ST upsloping in the deep version. Yeah, we are not uh, excluding coronary disease on the ECG. This is I think from the V3 also, sir. This ECG change is enough for any modern cardiologist to do an angiogram. You know, this, this electrocardiogram is yeah. compatible with your diagnosis because first we are looking at is it an LV pathology yeah. or not. Forget about the voltage modification, it is predominantly an LV morphology. And there are T wave changes over the left ventricular leads. So, there is, it is consistent with your diagnosis of LV myocardial disease. Yes. What exactly is the etiology? We have to evaluate. All the things which you have discussed, we have to evaluate. Okay. okay. So, the, so, the echo report. Increasing. No, you don't have the echo. Oh, no, no, we, are showing the, we are showing the report. Because of shortage of time. Okay, fine. Must be finding just a. Yeah, okay. Dilated. LV is dilated. 32% only ejection fraction. Okay. So this is not actually very Fractional shortening now also people are doing. Yeah, very good. Okay. 5.2. Systolic diaster, severe LV dysfunction, global. Right side. What is Right side is normal size. Okay. Normal. What about the right ventricular function? Somebody so might there have... There must be some pH. Yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, but you also see that severe MR. Yes. Severe MR, huh? okay. Mild TR, mild P. But our one thing, we should look into the right ventricular function also. And they will ask you questions on evaluation of right ventricular function. Because LV function, everybody knows the routine monotonous things. But now people are concentrating on the neglected side that is right side. So you should read about right ventricular function assessment by echocardiogram. And we have uh, Krishnam Jaji sir there who is an authority on that thing. Then um, MRI of the right ventricular function. Then you should look about the tricuspid valve. These are the areas which you have to read. RV function, especially in this case, it was relevant because we were uh, suspecting right ventricular involvement also. <laughs> Okay, so you want to conclude on that, you know, by what is the final diagnosis, what is the... Now the manage? question is, will you do coronary angiogram in this case? That is the next question. We have seen that the LV is dilated. LV is severe systolic dysfunction. Will you do coronary angiogram or not? As per the ACCH guidelines, all patients, all patients with uh, heart failure, <clears throat> unknown etiology. It is a class one indication for doing the procedure. But how will it benefit this? <laughs> now, that is the next thing. Now, is there any clue for ischemic heart disease? So, before go angiogram, you can do it to see what is the etiology. But whatever it is, if there is a lesion by revascularization, whether it will benefit, you have to have a good non invasive assessment of the myocardium. Yeah. The reversibility of the myocardial function, even if there is coronary disease. So, there is a second part which is further evaluation and management, which is a lengthy topic which we will discuss later because of shortage of time. Thank you. I think we will go on to the. Thank you, Sirisha, for your presentation. And I wish you best of luck next year. Thank you, sir. We will see you next year as the final year student. Exam going. Okay. Um, now we are going to have a talk um, on the role of uh, intracardiac echo in structural intervention. This is a brief introduction and some fundamentals to the candidates who are uh, 
who want to know more about intracardiac echo. Yes, sir. After this session, I know I have a an essential marriage to attend. No? Sure, 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 sure. No, no. After this, no. The time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For for the last case, I think that Krishnamurthy is there. Yeah. So, okay. Last case, I I don't think I will be there. Sure, sure. But you should join tomorrow. Ah, uh -huh. I'll join appropriately. Yeah. Tomorrow, our cardiologist in railway, his son is getting married. Uh, he is married already. <laughs> <laughs> CV, CV and Murthy. He is the chief now. Yes, sir. All our students have become chiefs everywhere. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Aravind Sharma in uh, Surat and Ahmedabad, he has got three Catholics. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I am Dr. Kiran Kumar Kajwala. I am a consultant cardiologist and cardiac electrophysiologist. office. I work at Sunshine Hospital, Sikhindrabad. So, my talk will be on intracardiac echocardiography and cardiac intelligence. Basically, I am an electrophysiologist, so my talk will be mostly on uh, electrophysiological interventions, but I will be covering the uh, Structural interventions as well. So, the ice or uh, technology was developed on technical basis of ions to meet the demand uh, during electro or physiological and structural cardiac interventions. The uh, ice will allow uh, real time assessment of cardiac anatomy during interventional procedures and guides factor manipulation in relation to different anatomy structures. Two different ice technologies are available. One is a radial or rotational ice, and another one is based on the apps. The radial or rotational ice uses a single piezoelectric crystal mounted at the tip of a 6 to 10 inch ice. So now, I see the feeling
There is some technical glitch. We'll be starting again five minutes. Starting nature. Uh, so starting nature. Uh, one more four steps. Okay, then we'll come back. Starting nature. Yes. This is to be. Check if any other device is uh, not nearby that location. Interesting. This is the play. Okay, can I? Can I Sir, we are still not able to hear your voice, sir. USB is not there, right? Okay, sir. USB is not there, sir. Okay. Okay. Sorry for the disturbance. And this is an ice catheter that we routinely uh, use in our lab. It's a eight French Acno ice catheter, and uh, it comes with a connector called Stripling connector that goes to the conventional ultrasound system. We use a GE DBQ system, and it is compatible with the Siemens uh, Acusan system as well. If you see the distal, distal tip of the transducer, it is a 64 uh, uh, small mount uh, transducer. So, so navigating the ice catheter. So, so most of the times we uh, do procedure from the right femoral side. side. So not to interfere with the primary procedure, we take left femoral venous access. Uh, I cannot gather the catheter that we use in our lab is eight French. Catheter. So usually we put a nine French sheet and we slowly advance this ice catheter to the mid area. So when you advance these slides, Kiran. Ah, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank <laughs> you.
Yeah. Okay, sorry for the disturbance. So navigating the ice catheter. So we take left femoral venous axis and we put a nine front sheath and through which we advance our eight front echinal catheter. And uh, when you advance the ice catheter, you don't, you don't need a, a fluoro guidance. As long as you see echo, echographic uh, clear space, that is a black space ahead of your catheter, you can advance your uh, ice catheter safely. And when you see any echogenic space, that is a white space ahead of your catheter, you have to stop it and you have to pull it back a little bit and you have to do uh, anti-flexion or retroflexion to advance the catheter to the mid -area. So when I do eyes, uh, these are the uh, views I typically take. So it's a stepwise approach. Once I advance the ice catheter to the mid area, uh, then I'll try to get a home view, that is home view where you see right atrium, tricuspid valve and the right ventricle. And from here you have to do slow clockwise rotation of this ice catheter. Then you see a RVOT view. From here if you slowly clock it, then you see a view that is what is called LVOT view, you see LV left ventricle, LVOT aortic valve and uh, ascending aorta and this is a perfect view uh, to implant uh, aortic valve during tower and from here if you do little clockwise then you will see left atrial appendage, left atrium, right atrium and interatrial septum cross-sectional view of the coronary sinus and mitral valve. This is a perfect view for implantation of the left, left atrial appendage as well as to do a uh, percutaneous balloon mitral valvotomy. And from here, if you uh, do a clockwise rotation, then you will you get a view called pan view where you see both left-sided pulmonary veins, left superior and left inferior pulmonary veins draining into the left atrium. And from here, if you do more clockwise rotation, you see the posterior structures that is esophagus and uh, uh, descending aorta. And from here, if you do a little bit more clockwise rotation, you see the right-sided pulmonary veins, right inferior and right superior pulmonary veins draining into the left atrium. So when you do any ASD or PFO closure, you have to make sure that you have to see all those pulmonary veins draining into the left atrium before you deploy the device. Lang.
Okay, sorry for the disturbance. So the standard ice views once you advance your ice catheter to the mid area, uh, then you have to get a home view where you see right atrium, tricuspid valve and the right ventricle and you can see iota and pulmonary, valve, pulmonary artery as well. So you apply a color doppler across uh, the tricuspid valve and you can look for the tricuspid regurgitation. So as you uh, do clockwise rotation of the probe, you get a view where you can see a ascending iota and LVOT and LV. This is a perfect view to implant a aortic valve during tower. And also when you apply a, a color doppler, you can see for any aortic regurgitation or any paravalvular leak after implantation of the aortic valve. From here, if you do a further clockwise rotation, then you will see a view where you can see the left atrial appendage, tricuspid valve, or mitral valve, right atrium, left atrium, and uh, you can see the thinned out portion of the interatrial septum, that is fossa avalis. This is a perfect view to implant left atrial appendage device, as well as when you do PBME, this is a perfect view which will guide you, uh, guide your balloon uh, across mitral valve, and you can see the balloon inflation and deflation. And from there, if you do uh, further clockwise rotation, you will see a view called pan view, where both left-sided pulmonary veins draining into the left atrium. If you apply the color doppler, you can see that both pulmonary veins draining into the left atrium. And further posteriorly, if you uh, do clockwise rotation, you will see descending iota as well as a esophagus. The uses of intracardiac echocardiography, uh, the most commonly used procedure is transeptal catheterization. And other ones are atrial septal defect closure, left atrial appendage imaging and closure procedures, balloon mitral valvatomy, TAVR, ablation of atrial fibrillation, and ablation of ventricular arrhythmias. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of ICE? So the ICE will give you high quality images. And uh, number two, the sedation or anesthesia is not required. And uh, it can be operated by the primary interventionalist and you don't need uh, another uh, uh, imaging guy. And there is no interference with the fluoroscopy when you do procedures. Now the 3D option is available so that you will uh, get, uh, uh, you can do more complex interventions like tower, left atrial appendage, uh, closures and uh, mitracle. The negative things about IC is it's invasive and cost. Each ice catheter will cost you around 1.5 to 2 lakhs. But the good thing is you can sterilize it and you can reuse it for at least 15 to 20 procedures. So the commercially available ice systems, there are n number of uh, commercially available ice systems. And uh, the most commonly used ice systems in the world, they are Akinav and Vueflex catheter. Akinav is from Siemens and Vueflex is from a St. Jude Medical. Both will come in 8 to 10 French uh, sizes. The image quality of uh, both of them are good. So most of my experience was with Akinav. I uh, did a couple of procedures with the Vueflex catheter. I liked the image quality, but it, it is a little bit stiffer. Uh, but both catheters, the tip is atraumatic, soft. So when you advance uh, these ice catheters in, the, in any vascular structure or uh, in any cardiac chamber, usually uh, they don't cause any cardiac perforation. So we have done some cases uh, using eyes. Uh, so eyes can be used for a left-sided accessory pathway ablations. 
and a transeptal axis using eyes and safe set NFR. So I don't use a broken brow needle for transeptal axis. I use a safe set NFR. So this is a 41 year old gentleman who came from uh, uh, Godavargani. It's a small town from uh, northern part of uh, Telangana. He presented with multiple episodes of palpitations since last 10 years. He was diagnosed to have SVT during palpitations and received adenosine multiple times for termination. And he was put on metoprolol for chronic management and he developed one more episode of SVT associated with presyncope and he was referred for ablation for us. And I did the workup and everything looks normal except the baseline ECG which showed a pre-excitation that is delta wave short PR interval and uh, there are a number of algorithms uh, based on which you can uh, you can uh, uh, locate uh, the accessory uh, pathway based on uh, the baseline EKG. Here you see a right bundle branch pattern. So most probably it is coming from the left side. And if the QRS is wide, then probably it's from the lateral side. And if the QRS is not, most of the times the pathway will be septal. So here probably the pathway is left lateral or left anterior. And this is a EKG during tachycardia showing a narrow complex tachycardia with short RP interval. It could be AVNRT or orthotromic AVRT or AVNRT. And I did an EP study for this guy and uh, I induced a tachycardia and it showed the earliest atrial signal was at CS distal. So the accessory pathway location was close to the CS distal uh, electrodes. So the, the left sided accessory pathway ablation can be done in two ways, what is uh, retroactic, another one is transeptal. I was trained uh, to do these uh, ablations uh, transeptally. So I took a SL1, that is FAB's left uh, one sheath and dilator system. And using the eyes here, you can clearly see the tinting of intraatrial septum. And from here, so I use safe septum of transeptal wire. Uh, uh, I don't use broken raw needle. And uh, there are n number of commercially available trans transeptal systems. The most commonly used in United States is Bayless Medical. It uses RF needle. I was trained for that, but uh, the RF uh, it, it requires RF generator, which is very expensive. It will cost you around thirty thousand dollars. And another one is a mechanical needle that is from BRK. Uh, and uh, Acutus Medical they recently they have come up with a new transeptal system, which is based on RF and electrocautery technology. And the safe set is from Project Products, which is it was developed by electrophysiologists. So the good thing about safe set wire is once you attend the septum, you just advance advance the the safe set wire, and uh, it's 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 a J wire basically. But as long as it is inside the sheath and dilator, it will be straight. Once you advance the wire across the septum, it will pierce the septum, and once it is inside the left atrium, it will assume a J. It becomes atraumatic and you can push this wire into the left superior pulmonary vein. And after that, you can advance your dilator and sheath. So here in this view, you can clearly see that uh, safe set wire. I just advanced the safe, safe set wire and you can clearly see here, once it entered the left atrium, it assumed J and I advanced this wire towards the left superior pulmonary vein. And this is a fluoroscopic view. I don't use uh, the pigtail catheter in iota. Uh, I just use eyes to do a transeptal axis. So here we tented the septum and this is eyes catheter in the mid area and this is a CS catheter. And I advanced to the safe set of wire and it entered the LA and I advanced further and it, it went to the left superior pulmonary vein which I could see in eyes. And after that, now I am sure that the wire, the safe set wire is in LA, left superior pulmonary vein. I could see it on floor as well as on ice. Now I will come to a view where I can see the ascending iota to make sure that the wire did not puncture the iota. So this is most important, important thing because before you advance your dilator and sheath into the uh, left atrium over this wire, you have to make sure that the wire is not in the left atrium. So once you are sure that the wire is in left superior pulmonary vein, you just advance your dilator and sheath. The wire will act as a rail and uh, the overshooting will not happen. So it, it becomes a traumatic. So it's just like a doing a 
femoral venous puncture. So after that, I pulled out the, the dilator and the wire and I advanced my sheath into the left atrium. Then I took a seven French ablation catheter and uh, I maneuvered that catheter towards uh, the pathway location, which is close to the uh, distal end of the ablation, uh, distal end of the CS catheter. And I looked for fused uh, atrial and ventricular signal and uh, I gave radio frequency energy. And you can see uh, the position of this uh, ablation catheter in eyes. So here you could clearly see this is a left atrial appendage and my ablation catheter is almost entering the left atrial appendage. So you can clearly see the location of this ablation catheter or any sheath, dilator, wire. So once you know it is in the left atrial appendage, you should not advance it. You have to pull it back a little bit and you have to maneuver that catheter towards a desired location. And this is a ECG after ablation. You don't see any right bundle branch pattern, no pre excitation, no delta wave, and uh, the patient got discharged. So, transeptal access uh, when you see an interatrial septal aneurysm. So, you can see uh, the interatrial septal aneurysm here. It's very difficult to puncture without ICE or TE guidance. And the conventional broken bro needle is. Is, is not a good uh, good needle to uh, puncture such kind of uh, neurismal uh, symptoms. So you need either TE, transesophageal echo or eyes and you have to use the RF uh, needle that is from Bayless or you have to use safe sept wire in such kind of cases so that you can do a controlled septal puncture. Otherwise you will be overshooting it and you, you will the patient will have a, a cardiac tampon mat. So the cryoablation for atrial fibrillation, the role of eyes, I was trained for cryoablation and most of the times, uh, not most of the times, 100% of the time we use eyes when we do cryoablation. So during cryoablation, uh, the eyes will help you to gain transeptal access and once you place your sheet into the left atrium, <coughs> Then you can visualize all four pulmonary veins and you can take, uh, you can measure the size and when you inflate the balloon, you can look for any leak uh, from pulmonary vein to the left atrium. If there is any leak, then you have to reposition your uh, balloon before you apply cryoenergy. And throughout the procedure, you park your uh, ice catheter in the mid area so that uh, you can monitor for any uh, procedural complications like a pericardial effusion. If that is so, you have, to, you can immediately act. So we have done uh, four uh, ice guided PBMVs so far and this is a 25 year old woman presented with CRSD and severe mitral stenosis. The mitral valve, mitral valve was suitable for balloon mitral valvotomy and we uh, we got the transeptal axis and then we advanced uh, the LA wire, the Jalebi wire and you can see uh, the, the wire in the LA. And you don't have to use fluoro because uh, as long as this fire is in area, you can safely advance or you can safely do a greater dilatation of the septum. And you can see this uh, mitral balloon clearly in the LA and uh, you can advance uh, this uh, mitral balloon across the mitral valve using the ice images. And after that, once the mitral balloon is in uh, LV, you have to uh, inflate it and once the distal portion is inflated, then you have to pull it back and uh, once it is across a mitral valve, you can clearly see uh, both uh, the distal and the proximal uh, uh, parts are inflated and uh, after you do balloon, up, uh, balloon dilatation, you can assess for mitral degustation and you can apply continuous wave Doppler and you can uh, look for uh, the mitral valve area. So this is a case I uh, did, uh, the patient is a 31 year old male presented with left posterior fascicular VT. So ICE will guide you in various VT ablations. So here I placed the ICE catheter in the RV and you can see this uh, SD grade catheter that is from St. Jude uh, along the septum. So you can, the ICE will help you to maneuver your uh, mapping as well as ablation catheter to a, into a desired location. To visualize the moderator band, the catheter has been advanced into the right ventricular. 
Okay, this is an image I took from my AHA. So you, using eyes, you can visualize uh, the moderator band and the papillary muscles as well. And when you place your ablation catheter, you can look for the tissue contact. And this is a, a lifted, this is a ASD device closure that we did a couple of weeks ago. Uh, she is a 25 year old lady presented with the ostium secundum type of ASD. So we advanced our uh, eye scatter into the mid area and here you can clearly see uh, the atrial septal defect and you can measure it. And this is more like a bicaval view. And we advanced our uh, guide wire into the left superior pulmonary vein that you can see on color Doppler. And we advanced uh, the delivery sheath into the LA. And then we deployed the left sided disc that you can clearly see in LA. And on the right side, this is a home view where you see right atrium, tricuspid valve and RV and we deployed the right side at disc and you, you clearly see the, uh, the delivery cable is still attached to the right side at disc. So the role of ice in trans catheter aortic valve replacement, we have a very good interventional team at Sunshine Hospitals. We do uh, a lot of uh, towers. And uh, ideally, transesophageal echo is recommended uh, during tower, but in case if there is any contraindication and if we cannot do a transesophageal echo, then uh, ICE will be alternative. And uh, with ICE, you can get cross-sectional view of the aortic valve and you can take measurements and you can deploy a device in LVOT view. And uh, after deployment of the device, you can assess for any paravalvular leak. And in left atrial appendage imaging and closure procedures, uh, uh, the intracardiac echo is an alternative. Uh, the standard of care will be transesophageal echo. And with the eyes, you can uh, take the measurements and you can uh, look for any thrombus or clot in the left atrial appendage. And you can safely uh, deploy the device, look for any leak between the device and the appendage. And you can monitor for any of the complications. So the role of eyes in detection of procedural complications. So when we do cryoablation, sometimes the patient may get a, a vagal reaction and they, they'll have a hypotension. And sometimes when we do VT ablations, they will develop hypertension. So once you place ice catheter inside, uh, inside the heart, you can, within two seconds or three seconds, you can find out the pericardial collection so that you can immediately address it. And when you place a delivery sheath or any ablation catheter, you can monitor for any clot or thrombus over the sheath or the ablation catheter. The future perspectives, the Siemens introduced a first real-time 3D volumetric ice catheter. I never used it. I don't have experience with this 3D ice system. And uh, in future, the 3D ice could become a favored imaging mode for newer and more complex interventions like tower, mitra clip, or left atrial appendage occlusion. So the conclusion, ICE provides high quality near field images of cardiac structures. ICE has partially replaced transesophageal echo for guidance of multiple invasive cardiac procedures. Its main disadvantage is higher cost, but you know, uh, you can sterilize it and you can reuse it and you can use one single catheter for at least 20 procedures. Shorter procedure times, avoidance of general anesthesia and prevention of complications may result in a favorable uh, cost benefit ratio. The clinical application of ICE will continue to expand and the advances in resolution and 3D image acquisition probably will replace a transesophageal echo in the near future. Thank you everyone for your kind attention and uh, sorry for the disturbance. And any questions? I don't see it. The person developed. Dr. Kiran, very excellent images you have shown and all. You may know what the frequency of the ice catheter. Uh, sir, it comes with, uh, I mean, uh, the, the catheter that I use is a 8 French Siemens catheter. Uh, it's, it's about 10 megahertz. 10 megahertz and all. Because, uh, like, uh, whatever said and done, the transesophageal resolution appears to be much more better than the, the resolution what we are having here now. Images. Is so, 
so sir uh, to be honest the resolution the image quality of the trans esophageal echo is much better than uh, uh, intracardiac echo but yeah, it is you. almost yeah. close it is almost close almost close okay okay thank yes. you but you have shown excellent uh, procedures and all types of procedures that can be done and uh, i think it makes the uh, transeptal septal puncture much more safer and uh, we use the transept uh, safe sept needle and uh, that way yes sir thank you sir thank you so any other questions comments sorry i think there are a lot of disturbance uh, in the presentation so so the intervention sometimes did uh, dr kiran kumar did you use it for any intracardiac bi biopsy sir we never uh, used it but uh, we can use it for uh, uh, endomyocardial biopsy and uh, you can use it for uh, assessment of the vegetation uh i mean they are still investigational but you can use it you can use it for endomyocardial biopsy assessment of vegetation such kind of things see you can use it uh, we were the first actually to use ice almost 13 14 years back uh we are used at that point in time we used basically one for the closure of the pfos some a difficult pfos not all of them some difficult pfos i can remember one which was a spiral shaped pfo so which we were unable to in fact cross cross over into left atrium so we did our best there was a pfo all right but it was a very curved and spiral pfo and the entry point and exit points are different per location in the atrial septum so ultimately we had to uh, abandon the procedure this lady the sister in law of one of our urologist she mm. had a leg fracture plaster and after the plaster was removed she had a paradoxical embolism with that she lost That's her true. speech for few minutes about 10 15 minutes she was aphasic <laughs> so that was indication why we wanted to do uh, this procedure but it was uh, i mean unsuccessful even with ice ice uh, usage and then we had to put her on only anticoagulants and leave her luckily nothing uh, no further events happened in her on anticoagulants uh, this was almost 14 years back and then we our ep team had used it for pulmonary venous location and uh, isolation okay, that is one of the main uses by our ep team pulmonary vein localization and then isolation and then uh, also visualizing whether there is any pulmonary venous stenosis immediately after the procedure yes damage to the pulmonary veins those days we were not using la appendage occlusion so we did not use it for that purpose and uh, i can't recall any pbmb being done with that though we knew that it could be used but uh, we did not use it for that purpose mainly these are the two we had used and i remember using it for a right atrial mass to get the biopsy done Okay, so yeah. yeah. So these are the three. Um, mostly, it was PFO and pulmonary vein identification and isolation. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And most of the times, I and mean, I mean, uh, we, I mean, most of my experience is with regards to pulmonary vein isolation by cryo. So I learned the, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the size uh, when I was doing the cryo ablation for a fib. So every time we do cryo ablation, we always use uh, uh, this ice technology because we can use continue uh, uh, the continuous wave Doppler, pulse wave Doppler, as well as we can use a color wave Doppler. So we can assess for any pulmonary venous stenosis, any leak, any complications uh, uh, during this uh, uh, cryo ablation for a pip. 
Yeah. We had used it 10 or 12 times. We had reused it 10 or 10, 12 times. Yes, yeah, sir. I mean, uh, I have, we have one catheter now. Uh, almost I used it uh, 20 times. And still the image quality is good. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Is Dr. Kavya available? Oh, yes, sir. Dr. Dr. Kavya? Yes, sir. Yeah, you are ready with your case presentation, madam? I'm ready, sir. Shall I share this, please? You're not audible, madam. You have to unmute. Sir, am I audible now? Sir, her voice is very clear. You are clear, Kavya. Okay. This fellow is gone. She is not able to... They're not able to hear the. They're not able to hear. Sir, the, they're saying know. that they can hear. One minute, one minute, Kavya, just one minute. Okay, sir. Okay. Okay. Can you speak out your name, madam, so that we can see? So yes, sir. This is Kavya, sir. Okay, we are audible now. Um, okay. first, Dr. Krishnam Raju, see there? Yeah, yeah. Good evening. Yeah. And uh, Dr. Sudhay Kumar is there? Sudhay? Dr. Sudhay Kumar? Dr. Nitin? Yes, I am here. I am yeah. here, sir. Nitin Kabra and Krishnam Raju. I am here, sir. I am here, sir. Sudhay Kumar. Yeah, this definitely. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Kavya is going to present the case, uh, the, the third and final case for today, and then we need to discuss that. Kavya? Yes, sir. Uh, can I share the screen, sir? Identify yourself and then start the presentation. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, good evening, respected faculty. I'm Dr. Kavya Anapredi from Sunshine Hospital. I'm a second year resident. Uh, can I start sharing the screen, sir? Sure. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. So is my screen visible, sir? Yes, it is visible. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my uh, I'm presenting a case of a patient by name Gangadhar, who is a 21 year old male patient. He is studying chemical engineering, and he is from Attapur. He had presented with the chief complaint of breathlessness since two years. The patient was apparently asymptomatic until two years ago when he developed breathlessness, which was insidious in onset and progressive. Initially, he would develop breathlessness after climbing two flights of stairs or hurrying on a level ground, which was suggestive of New York Heart Association Functional Class 2. At that point, he had consulted a cardiologist and he was told to have a cardiac condition, which, they, which the patient described as a hole in the heart and was advised surgery at that point. But he did not undergo the surgery then because he had his 10th class board exams. He was prescribed some medications at that point, which increased his urine output, which he used only for one or two months, and then he discontinued the medication. He felt symptomatically better for a couple of months, but then again, he started developing similar breathlessness, but he did not consult any doctor at that point. He was still continuing his regular activities. In fact, he was even playing cricket, although he was taking more frequent breaks than usual. Uh, the breathlessness had increased since the past one week, uh, so much so that he was feeling breathless even while going to the washroom, which is suggestive of uh, NYHA functional class 3. He did not give any history which was suggestive of orthopnea or PND. There was no complaints of limb swelling, abdominal distension or reduced urine output. There was no complaint of palpitations, chest pain, syncopal attacks or giddiness. No complaints of cough or wheeze. No complaints of fever, rash or joint pain. And no complaint of bluish discoloration of skin or mucous membranes, and no history of squatting spells. Uh, coming to the past history, uh, there is no history of diabetes, hypertension, CVA, bronchial asthma, pulmonary cox, or thyroid disorder. Personal history, he consumes a mixed diet. He does uh, complain of a reduced appetite, but there was no significant weight loss. There are no addictions, and his bowel and bladder habits were normal. The 
so the informant actually was the patient as well as the patient's father the mother was not available for the history but the father says that maternal history uh, there was no significant illness during the pregnancy it was a full term normal vaginal de- delivery and the uh, uh, child had cried immediately at birth his b- the birth weight exactly was not recollected but the father said it was told to be normal and he had acquired all the appropriate milestones at ap- at the appropriate age uh family history it was a non consanguineous marriage and there was no history there is no history of hypertension diabetes or sudden cardiac death the uh, patient has two elder brothers and one younger brother or uh, neither of whom have any diagnosed cardiac illnesses so should i summarize or stop summarize yes so uh, so i'm presenting a case of a 21 year old male who has presented with the progressive breathlessness since the past 2 years and at 2 years ago itself he was advised surgery which he had deferred and uh, so since the past 1 week there has been an increase in the uh, breathlessness to function in class 3 and and discuss sir so, so uh, with this history i have uh, kept the provisional diagnosis as an acyanotic congenital heart disease with a left to right shunt possibly a ventricular septal defect a patent ductus arteriosus or an asd though unless the less likely but given the prevalence my second provisional diagnosis is valvular heart disease possibly rheumatic in origin either mitral stenosis or aortic stenosis and third much more unlikely given the history but uh, it could be hypertrophic cardiomyopathy Why do we keep hypertrophic cardiomyopathy when they don't have any syncopal attack? <coughs> no excess. Uh, the only thing is exertional uh, dyspnea is the only yeah, symptom. And sudden deaths. Uh, n- none of this there, na? It's very unlikely, sir. Just that uh, the age group and because they had exertional dyspnea. What is in favor of uh, asymptomatic congenital heart disease? VSD, PD, ASD, shunt lesions. How do they present? So, sir, uh, so shunt lesions. at this age maybe uh, he has presented with symptoms of volume overload because he is having which is a congenital heart disease more common in that so case. more likely that it is uh, a post tricuspid shunt because he is giving exertional symptoms of breathlessness so maybe there is a, a left sided volume overload so possibly vsc or pda but the most common symptom with a congenital heart disease during childhood It's a recurrent uh, lower and upper respiratory tract infection. Was there any history of recurrent? Was, no, sorry, I didn't mention. No, sir, there was not. Nothing. No, sir. Uh, and the, what does it mean? Is it a significant shunt or uh, uh, more than two is to one or less than two is to one? Why? It, it means that there is an increased pulmonary blood flow. No, what sir is asking? Good morning, good evening, sir, everyone. Yeah, Doctor Sudhir, yeah. sorry, sir, I was busy with one case. Mm. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Would you have expected an improvement in his symptoms when he used diuretics in a patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? Ah uh, no, sir. Diuretics should be used cautiously. In fact, with patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, when you use, unless there is a fluid overload yes. in hypertrophic uh, cardiomyopathy, you don't use diuretics at all. No, sir. It could exaggerate. You can exaggerate, yes, sir. If there is a left ventricular outflow obstruction, yes, sir, likely to accelerate and increase the obstruction, make it worse. Yes. So the only situation where you can use it is uh, if there is a fluid overload, and two, there is one condition what is called as a uh, dilated hypertrophic congestive cardiomyopathy, which is the end stage. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Yes, burnt out. Last, I got him is fibrosed, then ventricle is dilated, obstruction disappears. It behaves like dilated cardiomyopathy at that stage. Okay. So these are the type of people who may be benefited by diuretics, but uh, without that, he is expected to be have more symptoms if you use diuretic. Yes, sir. Second thing is. Why did you not consider primary PAH? Oh, sir. Many years, mm-hmm. 
shortness of breath, progressive uh, symptoms. Don't go by the statement that uh, a particular cardiologist at some point in time told the patient yeah, he has a hole in the heart, you know. Hole in the heart basically is an expression metaphor for saying you have a birth defect. Yes, sir. Yes, so it doesn't really mean that there is a hole in the heart. Yes, sir. Most cardiologist physicians use that expression to convey that you have a birth defect of the heart. Okay. But you do. You should not take it as a straightforward hole somewhere in the heart. Yes. So the diagnosis is a uh, related to hole in the heart. PSD, PDA, ASD. You know. Yes. Sir. So it's unlikely that. Uh, ASD, VSD, PDA will appear for the first time with symptoms at the age of 21 years unless they have a pulmonary arterial hypertension um, with or without as Eisenmenger. Uh, otherwise, or occasionally, of course, a paradoxical embolism. And yes. third, infective endocarditis. But now VSD with PAH would be much earlier in the first decade. PDA would be somewhere around the second decade. And then ASD will be something like third, fourth. Decade. Yes. So if you take the A's into consideration, he falls into that uh, PDA circle, if at all. Yes, sir. If at all. And because there is no evidence of systemic embolism, his symptoms are unlikely to be due to paradoxical embolism. And he has no symptoms suggestive of infective endocarditis. Yes, sir. So, uh, I mean, primary pulmonary arterial hypertension also should be your okay, one of the differential diagnosis. Yes, sir. And it may not be heart disease at all, in fact. It may be a lung disease. Okay. Or it could simply be a severe anemia. Yes, sir. Right? Or it may be a metabolic cardiomyopathy like beriberi. Okay. Sir. I'm just giving examples. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, sir, okay. My, my problem in this case, I will come to the discussion how I will discuss. I'm okay. not happy with your different diagnosis of mitral stenosis or aortic stenosis. They are entirely two different physiologies. So that should not come. Because aortic stenosis is not a different diagnosis of mitral stenosis. That I was not that happy because entirely okay. different physiological things. So you should modify that. Now okay. I will be looking like this. This, this patient has developed symptom at the age of 20 years. Okay. Regarding the infancy history, as you have suggested, uh, mother is the correct person. So we don't have that to say yes or not. So, what are the situations where a person can become symptomatic at the age of 20 years? Okay, we presume that this is likely to be heart disease. As sir said in the morning also, we discuss all the other things, but we will take it as heart disease because it's a cardiology discussion. Now, could it be congenital heart disease? Because he was diagnosed to have a hole and advised surgery, you should see whether it was evaluated properly by a cardiologist with imaging methods. If it was like that, then which are the congenital heart diseases which can present symptomatically at the age of uh, 20 years. And obviously in the absence of cyanosis and lack of exertional breathlessness for the 20 years, cyanotic heart disease is very, very unlikely. Now yes. cyanotic heart disease will have symptoms in childhood itself. They will not have normal effort on. So among the cyanotic congenital heart disease, which are the things? We have common is three obstructions and three uh, shunnations. Sure. Of which the commonest is VSD followed by PDA, ASD. Now I look, why the patient develops symptoms at the age of 18 or 20 years? If it is VSD, why they develop symptoms? Usually it is mainly three hemodynamic changes which occur. One as sir said, development of pulmonary arterial hypertension and symptom expected to become a little early, quite early. Second is many patients can develop progressive aortic regurgitation. So the VSD will be relatively small, may remain less symptomatic, but the AR progresses and by this time they can become symptomatic because of AR. Third is VSD developing RVOT obstructions. They become progressive and they develop some degree of right to left and they become symptomatic at this age group. So these are the three 
physiological mechanism by, by which BSD can become symptomatic. There is one which I will entertain. It was asymptomatic and developing progressive symptoms at the age of 20 years, of which AR should come first, then a progressive RVOT obstruction and a PAH. PAH classically occurs in younger age group, but as per Paul Wood series, it was around the age of 18 years where he is diagnosed. PDA, it almost goes with VSD. They become symptomatic only when they develop pulmonary artery hypertension. Or as sir said, if the patient has developed infected endocarditis, problems related to endocarditis. ASD, as we said, less likely to develop symptoms at this age group. So that is about the shunned lesions. Then regarding the obstructive lesions, you can have aortic stenosis, coarctation of aorta. Aortic stenosis can remain asymptomatic and gradually can become symptomatic. Okay, they can progress yes. over here symptomatic but there was no symptoms to point to aortic stenosis though exertion dyspnea is the commonest symptom because of the hypertrophy and diastolic dysfunction some elevation of pulmonary virus pressure can occur which will get aggravated by exercise so that is one possibility coarctation of iota that also is possible but they don't have uh, they remain asymptomatic but uh, presenting with exertional breathlessness to class 3 is very, very unlikely over a short time. Over a short time, coarctation progressing from class 2 to class 3 is very unlikely. They remain minimally symptomatic. They present with detection of hypertension and probably some fatigue or claudication-like symptom. So that is the way I look at pulmonary stenosis. Uh, I've been known entertain because they usually remain asymptomatic. Or they may present with symptom of low cardiac output when it develop critical pulmonary stenosis going for RV decompensation. Then as you have said, if that diagnosis is not right, we have to look for other cause of left heart disease like valvular heart disease, mitral regurgitation or whatever it is we discuss in the morning. Yes. Then a different diagnosis will be myocardial disease. Then coming to the right heart, as sir said, a patient coming with symptoms at the age of 20 years, if it has been female, pulmonary hypertension, all those things should come in the list. But my diagnosis will be a congenital heart disease, probably VSD developing either AR as the common thing or RVOT obstruction, I will put it well ahead. Then bicuspid aortic valve, they develop progressive aortic stenosis which can present at this A group. Quartation, this is not the usual presentation. Leaving that, you can take a valor heart disease of which the commonest is mitral valve regurgitation due to rheumatic or non-rheumatic or um, any combination can present with class 2 to class 3 symptoms without severe pulmonary venous condition. Okay. Iotic stenosis I may not entertain because there are no symptoms of iotic stenosis, but in the congenital we have discussed. The myopathies we have already discussed, any left heart disease with the left heart symptoms, the different diagnosis of myocardial disease will come into play. That's the way I approach this case. Okay. Okay. Could you, could you, could you entertain a diagnosis of coronary artery disease or systemic hypertension for a moment forgetting somebody told that there was a hole in the heart uh, <clears throat> yes sir um, if the patient had family history of coronary artery disease or if he had uh, hyperhomocystinemia or family or dyslipidemia he could have coronary artery disease See, the, at least approximately 15 to 20 percent of uh, acute infarcts in current uh, era are around the age of 20 to 25. Yes. Uh, in our own hospital experience, every month we receive two or three acute infarcts uh, or sudden deaths in gymnasia. Okay. The gyms, <coughs> playing grounds. The age group of these people is between 20 and 30. So it is not that unusual, which may be because of congenital coronary artery anomalies or premature coronary atherosclerosis, etc. You know, we will not go into that uh, big list of those uh, premature coronary artery disease or even a coronary artery spasm, for example. So there are many, quite a few of them are there. Uh, coronary, uh, spontaneous dissection of the coronary artery can present as a acute emergency, though more often in women. So I mean, now uh, we need to keep those things in mind. Our titis, homozygous hyperlipidemia, and as you mentioned, uh, homocystinemia sometimes, 
etc. So you need to keep those things in mind. I will not be terribly surprised if somebody presenting like this thing uh, has a premature coronary artery disease. Yes, yes. Have you any existential palpitations are there? No, sir. He does not have history of palpitation. Uh, if congenital heart, aseratic congenital heart, shunt lesions, yes. will they present with palpitations or obstructive lesions? Who will commonly present with palpitations? Why? What is the reason? Sir, uh, uh, shunt lesions with the, can present with exertion and palpitations because of the volume overload, sir. Suppose if there is there, what does it indicate? It may be a very small uh, defect. It may not be very large defect. The large defect with more value, like a rear yes. lesions, definitely yes. they should have a good accessional palpitations. If that yes, kind sir. of history is not there, maybe it's a small. Yes, sir. So any fever history for worsening? Any history of fever? No fever, no, sir. No, no, no history of fever. Though they are uncommon, don't ignore uh, masses, cardiac masses. Okay. Either benign masses or malignant masses, which are not unusual in this age group. We have seen plenty of them. Yes. Two things in the history which I would like to modify or add is, you should, if you are dealing with congenital disease, where pulmonary hypertension is coming into picture, all those things, history of hemoptysis also, you should have said so many negative things. But history okay. of hemoptysis also, you should say. Another thing which I want to modify, don't say that he was prescribed a drug which produced excess uh, urine. You can use the term he was prescribed diuretics. Okay. okay. At postgraduate level, you can draw conclusions like that. Okay. okay. Fine. Go ahead. Fine. So coming to the examination, on general examination, the patient was coherent, oriented, time, place and person and had a lean build. His height was 160, is 168 centimeters, his weight is 42 kgs and the BMI is 14.8. The arm span is 156 centimeters, upper segment 83 centimeters and lower segment 85 centimeters. There was no pallor, ictus, uh, central or peripheral cyanosis, generalized club, uh, clubbing, generalized lymphadenopathy or fetal edema. The pulse was 82 beats per minute, regular, high volume, normal character, normal vessel wall character, no radio radial or radio femoral delays and all peripheral pulses were equally felt. Blood pressure in the right upper limb in supine position was 150 by 90 millimeter mercury and left upper limb was 150 by 92 millimeter mercury and right lower limb systolic blood pressure was 160 millimeter mercury. The respiratory rate was 18 breaths per minute. Uh, the JVP was pulse dial, all waveforms were visualized. It was measured 4 centimeters above the sternal angle uh, in, in 45 degrees. And there was normal respiratory variation and abdominal jugular reflux was normal. What is the, why lower limb BP is higher than upper limb BP? So, uh, so that is because, is uh, so the, uh, the pulse is transmitted faster to the femoral arteries and oh no, what is the concept? Why usually lower limb is little higher than an upper limb as you go periphery? And when it becomes more accentuated. Uh, that is known as peripheral amplification. Yes, okay. So what is the cause for peripheral amplification? What is the mechanism for that? Uh, I'm not sure. Okay, see what uh, the pulse is, it moves uh, to the periphery. There will be it's multiple branching amplitude. vessels will be there. So there will be some forward bow and backward flow. So yes, when yes. the pulse go peripherally more distally, will be with the branches, there will be turbulence, there will be little bit more back flow. So, and so once they reach the periphery, it will become the <laughs> usually happen only to the systolic wave. For diastolic okay. pulse, you pressure okay. usually depends on the vessel wall. It does the more and more branching, more and more reflected wave, it becomes more and more prominent. So that's why in the condition when like AR or PDA, the normal difference 10 to 20 only. But when okay. it becomes AR or high volume condition, hypodynamic condition becomes more and more prominent. That is the concept when you go from the periphery to empty, then will be the pressure 
difference between upper and lower will be higher. So that itself, such as the volume overloading or the runoff condition, is more significant. Yes. Okay. Please go there ahead. The, uh, there, the augmentation pressure also is important. Because yes. We have the central augmentation and the peripheral augmentation. So here, what happens is in the central, if you take the augmentation index, all those things. it occurs because of the recoiling of the proximal greater vessels so it will be the systolic followed by the augmentation as you go distally the systolic wave is a little delayed and the peripheral augmentation comes and it occurs simultaneously that is also another explanation which is given for the rise in the pressure as you go peripherally one the systolic wave is a little delayed the peripheral augmentation from the arterial or smooth muscles that reflectant wave comes early so this coincides so that it will be submitted thing whereas in the central vessel it will be the systolic followed by the augmentation so that the total height may not be that high okay go ahead and second thing in the jvp you cannot say that all wave sounds are visualized no that is not enough You have to say okay. A and B wave seen, X and Y wave seen. Are the waves okay. normal or not? That is important. Okay. 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 Fine. They were no. normal. But the wave was normal. Yes, sir, they were normal. So you say that both okay. A and B wave in normal, X and Y wave are normal. Okay. okay. Go ahead. Uh, the patient with afibril uh, saturation was ninety nine percent in all four limbs. Oral examination was normal. Thyroid examination was normal. There were no peripheral signs of infective endocarditis or rheumatic fever, and they were had normal faces. What is the importance when sir asked before that saturation is no ninety nine percent equal in all four limbs? Yes, sir, because uh, if the patient has a PDA with reversal of shunt, he might have a differential cyanosis. Okay, so PDA with uh, Eisenmenger with reversal of shunt. Any other you will see reverse differential cyanosis. Reverse yes, sir. If they have a transposition of the great arteries, and in the presence of a PDA and the reverse of the shunt, they are not present up to twenty-one years of age. It will be very extremely rare. Uh, yeah. And a PDA yes. Eisenmenger, you can see at this age also, where the differential cyanosis yes. clubbing becomes important. Good, yes, go sir. ahead. Uh, coming to the cardiovascular system examination, inspection, and palpation, the chest wall is uh, bilaterally symmetrical. The cardium was normal. Apex was localized to the sixth intercostal space, one centimeter lateral to the mid clavicular line. It was hyperdynamic and occupied less than two thirds of the systole. A left parastern lift was palpable, which was grade three. There were no palpable sounds or thrills, and no scars or sinuses. So, grade three left parastern heave. You are telling what does it indicate? Mm. Sir, uh, it could either be because of an enlarged RV or an LA, sir. So how you can differentiate? So we can differentiate it by correlating it with the apex. If it is occurring exactly with the timing of the apex, it could be the RV. If it is just before that, it is possibly because of an enlarged LA. No, LA is early. Direct sense. RV is early. Oh, okay. That is the if it is before the apex, LA cannot MR cannot occur before the onset of systole. Apex is predominantly isometric contraction. Okay, yes. so it cannot be before that. But you have to say yes. I'm left parasternal heave with epigastric pulsations. Yes. That is possible. Then it's RV. Very okay. simple. Second thing is LA expansion is relatively late, and third is the anatomically parasternal heave is closer to the sternum, whereas LA expansion is a little lateral and little higher up. Okay. Okay. These are the yes. three points you can tell. Okay, go ahead. Uh, in percussion, the liver dullness is percussed in the right fifth intercostal space. Right hard border corresponded to the sternum. Left hard border corresponded to the apex, and the left second intercostal space was resonant. In before auscultation, I think before yes. auscultation, now you have to have some differential diagnosis to see what are the things you are going to look for. So so okay. far, you have found the patient is in sinusism. He is not in congestive heart failure. There is cardiomegaly. Cardiomegaly is due to which chamber enlargement? Uh, obviously, the left ventricle. So there is a left ventricular dilatation. So yes, left ventricle is receiving a larger volume. We have seen the BP is 150 by 90. That also you should keep in mind. Yes. Now you have a left parasternal heave of grade three indicates significant pH, without a thrill, without anything in the pulmonary area. 
you are not seeing pulsations you are not no. feeling the second sound you are not feeling or you are not percussed out so that seems to be a very odd thing okay when there is severe rvh why the patient have a rvh severe rvh is either because of a pulmonary hyperensis situation or a severe rvot obstruction and this is lacking because usually with this much of rvh we expect something there yes, so sir. you have made it very clear that the second sound is not palpable yes sir. there are no pulses in the second space okay ordinarily with the normal cardiac anatomy or vascular anatomy we can say that there is no clinical evidence of ph and you didn't yes, feel thrill also so these are some sure. of the things so there is some oddity in the findings at that palpation level so we should be careful when you are auscultating it should be okay. congruous or if not you should go back and examine okay go ahead okay. do you think it could have been a corrected transposition where the aorta is anterior and it is simulating the left parasternal lift okay possible that is another uh, differential diagnosis for a left parasternal though aortic lift will be slightly higher one space higher, higher you would also yes. expect to be able to palpate second heart sound okay in a correct transposition all findings look like ph but there is no ph okay so that is the clue look like ph but no ph is likely to be correct transposition and all those findings are because of a anterior aorta yes. uh, coming to the auscultation the first heart sound was normal the second heart sound was paradoxically split with a loud p2 there was no third or fourth heart sound a high pitched continuous machinery murmur was heard which was loudest in the left second intercostal space it was best heard with the diaphragm of the stethoscope in expression of the patient in sitting and leaning forward uh, position and eddy sounds were also audible any other murmur you look for in this case nothing else was audible sir. what did you look for uh, sir i uh, if there was an ejection systolic not that no you can't hear an ejection systolic murmur when you have a such a loud continuous, continuous murmur but yeah. other murmurs like for example sir, a flow murmur across the mitral mitral flow yeah. murmur to be heard yeah. for example or if there is a peripheral pulmonic stenosis as well you may hear again another continuous murmur elsewhere because pda and peripheral ps also is a known uh, not unusual known combination and then for example if there is ph there may be pr as well pulmonary regurgitation yes. what is the right? difference of that condition and uh, uh, you oh, may sorry. have bicuspid aortic valve and there may be some aortic valve stenosis and with or without aortic valve stenosis bicuspid aortic valve itself can give rise to uh, some mid systolic murmur okay all right yes. so some of these things are possible in combination okay but the only murmurs which you hear in uh, uh, duct for example i think you are driving towards duct is continuous murmur if the shunt is a continuous shunt and then a flow murmur across the mitral valve and a flow murmur across the aortic valve these three murmurs are quite compatible with a uh, ductus with large left to right shunt okay then you said ed sounds but these ed sounds you have not described these ed sounds are systolic or diastolic constant or inconstant yeah, what is the reason for that actually So the eddy sounds are produced because of the opposing diagonal flows from the through the pulmonary artery and from the aorta. Mm -hmm. So they are uh, the diagonal flows which coincide with each other produce the eddy sounds. So what are actually that sounds? That's what Sir was asking. Okay, what are the sounds? Is systolic, diastolic? What is the nature? How it? Uh, what is the auscultatory characteristic of that? Two total eddy sounds. Which of those sounds 
constant sounds or inconstant sounds mm-hmm. systolic diastolic systolic and diastolic no first you describe the quality of the sound and the timing of the sounds and then you label them as ad or otherwise okay so first you describe the sounds they were there is sort of a, a low pitch sound which was a low pitch sound it sounds according to your low pitch if you are not sure say i am not i am not sure sir sorry yeah, that's a best question okay that's a familiar question that is <laughs> <laughs> hmm. so, the sound you have been made it up because there was a there was a what you suspected was was a pd okay. that is the why, i thought why, why you were asking like that interrupting the second, thing, second thing i would like to ask is if. how did you make it out that p2 was loud in a paradoxically ah, split that's, second uh, that's the thing which i want to ask i yeah. just want to ask what is the grade of this murmur you have to, <laughs> okay what is the grade of the murmur So because it's a continuous murmur great great you cannot grade it you can grade it great you can grade it no problem how much how loud it is then it was grade 3 by 6 only grade 3 continuous murmur then the continuous it. murmur do you think that the, you have to make the patient sit and lean forwards i have not learned that there is no need for that that's only for aortic regurgitation second okay. thing how to pick up the paradoxical details of the second sound when you play <laughs> high loud murmur in the pulmonary area really extremely <laughs> difficult then second so it, when there is paradoxical split to say that which component is loud is extremely loud is very difficult for us okay. because <laughs> the paradoxical split itself is an extremely difficult thing whenever i have diagnosed paradoxical split it was wrong 80% of the occasions clinically so here is a loud murmur in the second space you are picking a paradoxical split and then you are saying loud p2 that means the second component is uh, louder or the first component is louder now you have second component you have to you have to think again it is the first component which has to be loud in paradoxical pain that is pitu second component in which phase of respiration so the split was audible in expiration no, it was difficult madam it is extremely no, no. so, so second is, split was audible in in expiration or inspiration in expiration expiration so it was audible com- in expiration but i wasn't I, i honestly was not sure which component it was It was sounded like a loud S too. That is it. That is it. So okay. No, no, one of the one of the important things what you left out is what is missing in this continuous machinery moment statement. Ah, uh, so transmission. It was the transmission of the moment. No, this Where continuous moment. Like no, no, continuous moment. was louder in the near so the which component sound. of uh, so yeah it no, was louder it's speaking in the second heart sound around how it's second heart sound so around the written? second heart sound where is it written it's not written i haven't written yeah which component was was louder the systolic uh, component was uh, longer sound and the murmur was definitely louder around the second uh, heart sound and then in diastolic component was uh, softer No, no, was it a longer diastolic component of the shorter? Lungs? The diastolic component was relatively shorter than the systolic. What does that indicate? So that could be that the patient is going into isomangrization. Isomangrization? No, no. Do you ever get a diastolic moment? They won't. Be. It will be only systolic component. Then why are you telling? You, know, you said there is a continuous moment. So you think it is? Why do you think it is a PDA moment? Somebody says it is pulmonary AV fistula. Uh, How do you distinguish the pulmonary AV fistula from a PDA murmur? Not sure. Uh, for any sure. murmur, for <laughs> any murmur, most important is why do how can you say systolic murmur is mitral, tricuspid, aortic, or this thing? How location. do you tell location? Okay. Okay, location. There is one. Then you look at the character of the movement. the intensity of the murmur then the dynamic auscultations all those things so you know the answer you extrapolate this and tell then you can answer that okay i'll i'll make your answer a bit more simpler okay which which maneuver you would like to do uh-huh. if there is a suspected pulmonary av fistula so for a pda murmur if we do isometric no, no, hand grip no, no, it will no, no, bring no. out the diaphragm please can you listen to the question <laughs> okay sir can you listen to the question <laughs> which da- which maneuver you will like to do is <laughs> as a ready pulmonary av fistula you say i don't uh, know 
Sorry? Heard about something called Branham? Three. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> okay. Respiratory variation, anything is there that you have to see. Dynamic ascultation features you have to tell. Yes. No, no. Uh, no, it is a manure which is not by Which dynamic manure? Muller, Muller's manure. Okay. Yeah, Muller's, what do you do exactly? Well, dynamic aspect. So, so it is a expiration against the closed glottis. Expiration against the closed glottis, is it? Then what is what's Inspir Inspiration, sorry, sir. Inspiration. Yes. So, what happens? The intrapulation during inspiration. <laughs> so you have to change the flow across the pulmonary arteriovenous fistula by any maneuver you choose. <laughs> so what maneuvers will change the pulmonary blood flow? Sir, the higher the pulmonary blood flow, the higher is the shunt intrapulmonary. Yes. So if you have alsalva, during the strain phase what happens? The pulmonary blood flow is? Decreases mm -hmm. or so it decreases. Yeah. Then in the uh, release. In the release phase, phase there'll be increased capacitance, and then there'll be increased uh, pulmonary blood flow. So that is one of the maneuvers which you can do. Okay. And a simpler maneuver could be a simply making the patient stand up. So yes. when patient <coughs> stand up, what happens? Pulmonary blood flow is decreased. Yes. Right. I got a more. I got a more fundamental question. Could you yes. define what is continuous murmur? Mm -hmm. uh, continuous murmur is one which starts uh, in the systole, and it extends. It engulfs the second heart sound and extends to some or most of the sec uh, of diastole. Mm -hmm. And it so originates from a single. No, no. Essentially, it is the same thing what you are telling, but you should tell it in a bit more scientific way. You should really mug it up that the, that the definition given by ACCAHA. Okay. Any murmur that starts in any part of systole goes through uninterruptedly through the second heart sound and okay. ends in part or whole of diastole. Okay. So I think you know it is important because every every component of the statement is important. It can start late in systole and end in early diastole. The murmur may look very short, but by definition, it is continuous murmur. A murmur can start early, late in systole and continue throughout the diastole. That is also okay. continuous murmur. Yes. So basically, what is important there in continuous murmur is it goes through the second heart sound second. interruptedly. Okay. What are the continuous murmurs in the ductal site? That is second left intercostal space. What are all the various continuous murmurs which form the differential diagnosis? The, uh, the differential diagnosis can be, uh, so it can depend on the etiology as well. It could be because of, uh, uh, from a high pressure to low pressure system, either there is a shunt, which is a PDS shunt, or it could be an AP window, or it could be because of a ruptured sinus of Valsalva. Uh, no, 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 no. I think you missed my point. Continuous murmur in ductal site, that is second okay. left intercostal space. Oh. Don't give me the entire list of continuous murmurs. Okay. I'm asking about continuous murmur in left intercostal space, which forms the differential diagnosis for a ductus. Okay. Uh, of, uh, VSD with AR. No, that is not continuous it's two, murmur. It's to and fro. No, no, that is not in the second space. So you have to um, answer that to the question. AP window also not. Yeah, uh, Kavya, don't commit any mistake. If you don't okay. say, you, you, I don't know. Like, but this uh, okay. uh, dragging it to yourself into a different situation. Okay. One <laughs> instead of continuous farmers. Do you oh. know any procedure for cyanotic congenital disease which can produce continuous murmur there? So BT shunt. BT shunt. Similarly, any other natural thing which can produce continuous murmur all over the chest in the second space also in cyanotic. Oh, so it can be heard all over the chest. It can be heard in the second space also. What is that? Coarctation. No, cyanotic anemia disease. Okay. Pulmonary atresia. Collaterals. AP collaterals okay. we can have. Then anything which can come through the coronaries to the pulmonary artery. 
Sen al kap ar anomalous and like that. Or something else which is draining to the pulmonary artery extremely rarely from the coronary artery to the pulmonary artery rare. And marmas are very coronary artery to fistula to the pulmonary artery. Okay. And extremely rarely you can have RSOV to the pulmonary artery. So you know the answers because you started with the classification. But the thing would have been you should have crystallized it to pulmonary area alone because you started in the correct method that is high pressure to low pressure system. There is a uh, approach like this high pressure to low pressure is arterio arterial. Okay, which could be systemic to pulmonary artery, systemic to I uh, systemic to systemic artery. Systemic to pulmonary artery, we have discussed all those things. Systemic to iota, not in the pulmonary area, co coartation, the communications. Okay. It is systemic to systemic artery collaterals. Okay, high pressure to low pressure. Then arterio venous, which could be systemic, pulmonary, or coronary. Then arterio cameral. The classical is RSOV as well as coronary artery fistula yeah. and camerocameral that is a restrictive ASD with high left atrial pressure as in mitostenosis especially following a PFO you can have. These are some of the pathological. Then it could be arterial alone that is arterial obstructions or an increased arterial flow. Classically the mammary is so full there could be an increased flow to a tumor or it could be uh, members uh, then arterial, um, arterial stenosis of anywhere, you can have a continuous movement. Then venous. Venous could be due to venous flow increase as in venous arm or TAPVC. Okay. Or it could be venous obstruction. Okay. Venous obstruction. TAPVC you can have getting obstructed. These are the ways you can classify. From this classification, we have to pick up the continuous murmurs which can happen in the cause space. There are few things, there are few things which may be mistaken for PDA. Okay. One is a, if somebody has a dialysis fistula in the left arm, dialysis arteriovenous fistula in the left arm, or any other fistula in the left arm is a traumatic <coughs> congenital. This murmur is conducted to the left infraclavicular as well. So, if you did not know that there is a AV fistula or dialysis fistula in the left arm, you may think that there is a local problem. And then intercostal arteriovenous fistula, intercostal arteriovenous fistula. Or we have seen a subclavian arteriovenous fistula due to a gunshot wound. Or the venous harm, loud venous harms, which may be conducted in uh, infraclavicular area or a left pulmonary arterial stenosis, peripheral pulmonary Very arterial good. stenosis with an increased pulmonary blood flow due to a shunt can also have a continuous murmur there. Okay. Right? Yes. And then the corollary next question, if I were your examiner, would ask you is about the uh, continuous murmurs in the second right intercostal Space. Sir, uh, AP window. Second okay. right intercostal space. Okay. But which AP window will cause continuous murmur? Normal AP window won't cause, sir. Because AP window usually is large, so it won't cause continuous murmur. Until there is a restrictive okay. AP window, which is itself is very rare. In that KV, I think it's very pertinent. 80% of AP window will have systolic murmur. Systolic. Only 20%. Why? Because as Sudhi told. Because they are large AP windows, and by the time by, by one year of age, they develop severe pH. Because yes. Severe okay. pH is impossible to have a continuous murmur, it's only a systolic murmur. So it's a minority okay. of AP windows who are going to have a continuous murmur. I think this is the second time you are telling AP window. Yes. Okay, so that should not, don't bring it okay. to the future of murmur. And I think Sudakumar has already given a good uh, classification of that. Okay, you can have arterial, venous, or arterial venous communications. Okay, yes. so simple peripheral artery stenosis can also lead to a continuous murmur. Okay, venous yes. is a classical example of a venous continuous murmur and uh, PDA you have already given as a communication of between uh, arterial system and the venous system and all. Of course, there's a big list which we have yes. to know. And cirrhosis of liver and uh, carbilinear broom garden syndromes and all, yes. I think also you should remember as cause okay. of this murmurs and this one. And I think uh, probably all of you can uh, read Hust. Hust has given very good description of continuous murmurs and all, more uh, better than Brownwald also.
Okay. Uh, shall we proceed? I think we can. Uh, we shall proceed our office, sir. Doctor Shankar sir and Doctor Kumar sir. Diagnosis then. Yes. Uh, the system examination is normal. Uh, the final diagnosis is situs solitus levocardia, asynotic congenital heart disease with a post tricuspid shunt lesion uh, that is moderate patent ductus arteriosus, not in heart failure, in sinus rhythm. Currently, in NHA function is as three. With no signs of infective endocarditis. What so why, why are you saying moderate? Yeah. Because uh, actually you are referring to shunt flow. So you should have said patient ductus arteriosus with more than or less than two is to one left to right shunt. Okay. And there is or there is not right to left shunt. That is how it need to be. When you say moderate patent ductus arteriosus, are you referring to the volume of the shunt? Are you referring to the size of PDA? It is not clear in the way you are expressing. Okay, I meant it is moderate because of no. size causing no, no, less. No, 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 no. You cannot assess the size clinically. You are assessing okay. by physiology. And whenever you are putting it as moderate, you should be careful. The question okay. will be how will you assess the uh, shunt magnitude and what are the factors which might have modified in this case. That is a thing which you have to look into. Post tricuspid left right shunt, patent ductus arteriosus. What is the evidence of a large left right flow? What is the evidence of large left right flow in ductus arteriosus? Most importantly, yeah. white pulse pressure, yeah. and okay. pressure left ventricular enlargement and most importantly is mitral MDM. Here the diastolic pressure is not low. Okay, did you include systemic hypertension in the diagnosis? Because the blood pressure is 150 by 90. You should include that. And I may be interested in asking questions on systemic hypertension also. So you should include that. So the left right chin assessment, magnitude of shunt is what is the degree of aortic runoff where diastolic pressure is very useful. Then left ventricular enlargement this patient has, but you didn't get the mitral MDM. Then why there is no mitral MDM, but you have a parasternal heave. So how can you explain that? Yes, LV enlargement. So that means he had a good left right shunt, but now you are not hearing the mitral MDM. Why it is not heard? And you have a parasternal heave. The second zone you said P2 is loud. So the patient is developing pulmonary arterial hypertension. You have to bring in pulmonary arterial hypertension also because we have said grade 3 parasonal heave. We will verify that. We have said that the P2 is accentuated and probably you have extrapolated some of the findings like paradoxical split and loud P2. Because you probably learned that PDA produces a paradoxical split. That is the reason why you might have put that paradoxical split. But you don't know what happens to the second zone split when they develop PH. Because you have to explain the parasonal heave of grade 3 intensity. So yes. the findings are not that straightforward. There are some oddities. And what is the influence of systemic hypertension on PDA? What is the influence of systemic hypertension on PDA? Uh, the patient can develop heart failure. No, the left right shunt will increase. The left right shunt. So there are so many factors which can modify the clinical findings in a patient in this case and difficulty in assessing each component like magnitude of the left right shunt, degree of pH, what is the role of systemic hypertension. When there is systemic hypertension, the left right shunt should increase. So the things will become more difficult when there is systemic hypertension, pulmonary hypertension, all those things. So there are so many things which can modify the findings, but you cannot say a large left right shunt because to say that still there is a large left right shunt, I want a mitral MDM. Yeah. So you have to look okay. for the diastolic pressure in the iota should come down. Mm -hmm. It should not come down. Second, you have to explain the parasternal heave of right into hypertrophy, provided your findings are right. Okay. okay. See, your paradoxical split is best to hurt in left bundle branch block without aortic stenosis to yes. hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy because there the A2 is very nicely heard in both hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy 
and LVB. But whereas in patients who have aortic valve stenosis, K2 is muffled. Though you may be able to record a paradoxical split on phonocardiogram, clinically to hear that is very, very difficult because A2 is very, very soft or even absent because of low flow across the aortic valve or sclerotic or calcific aortic valve. So theoretically it may be present, but clinically you may not hear it. The okay. one thing uh, to remember, Kavya, is you should not forget exactly. to mention about PAH here. Even if you okay. think about PAH in the side, in complete diagnosis, the physiological yes. component of diagnosis, okay, it should include PAH. Okay. So either no PAH, mild PAH, moderate, severe PAH and all. But without okay. the diagnosis, it becomes incomplete. So remember that point. Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. So this what is one thing. What is the importance of the AD sounds? We talked quite a bit about AD sounds, though you did not answer. But what is its clinical significance in a given case? I'm not sure. Pardon? I'm not sure. <coughs> no, we have other <coughs> murmurs like <coughs> sinus of well salva, etc., coronary arterio, venous fistula, alcapa, etc., etc. Now, they don't have AD sounds. Yes. <coughs> EDA is the only one which has AD sounds. Because here you have two streams. Yes. So that is where it helps. The presence of AD sounds will give a very, very strong, uh, I mean, uh, point to back up the diagnosis of uh, ductus mm -hmm. ductus arteriosus. And AD sounds indicate that still there is a good left-right flow across the ductus. Yeah. When there are two flows, yeah. which means there are good flows and pulmonary arterial pressure is unlikely to be very high. There may be mild increase, but unlikely to be very high. So when you are finding it difficult to correlate all the findings, you have to go back. This is one situation where the examiner may verify the findings. Okay. Paradoxical split a second zone, you should be extremely careful. Okay. okay. How do you explain the paradoxical split in uh, PDA? So because of the uh, increased LV volume, there can be a longer... Uh, the okay. hangout interval will prolong, so A2 can be delayed. Uh, why the hangout interval is prolonged? Because of the increased LV ejection time. No, that is not hangout interval. Hangout interval is influenced by the... It is determined by the... The pre uh, pressure. Not the pressure. Peripheral vascular resistance. resistance. Okay. So what happened to systemic vascular resistance in PDA and AR? So the, uh, it it come down. Decreases. It's a natural protective mechanism. So when the aortic resistance comes down, the aortic runoff will come down, whether it is AR or PDA. So that is the reason for one of the reasons. Second, you have definitely a left ventricular volume overload going to the aorta. So, there is a larger left ventricular volume overload and there is a uh, reduced hangout interval. But do, what is the hangout interval in this case? You have found the pressure is 150 by 90. Yes. So the systemic vascular resistance is not low. Not low. So if we go into the finer aspects of paradoxical split, it is extremely difficult to explain. But before okay. that, you should realize that paradoxical split is a very, very difficult finding. And as Sir said, the only situation where I have been right in paradoxical split is then I auscultated after seeing LBB. LBB. Okay. LBB. Okay. There are two LBB with no myocardial disease. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Because okay. With, if there is myocardial disease, there will be muffling of the heart sounds. So you may not be able to hear okay. A2 very well. Okay, that is the diagnosis. So if I, uh, Dr. Sudhay Kumar, I was reading the biography of Leonardo da Vinci yeah. uh, a month back. Uh, Leonardo was the first one to describe this uh, hangout interval, yeah, yeah. though he did not use that word hangout Nobody. interval, but actually he was the one who had, uh, I mean, demonstrated that in his own private lab. Great. So shall we go? So here there are some oddities. 
in your findings and then diagnosis so we will go to the investigations okay okay what investigation would you like to have there's a usual question that is asked so uh, i would like to have x-ray and ecg simultaneously okay 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 sampriya to stop sharing your screen okay sir. which one will give you more information for your differential diagnosis in this patient Just X-ray. Just X-ray. But what reason? The so one is for the chamber enlargement. Okay, you have and cardiomegaly. That is there. Okay. But uh, multiple. And for the pulmonary artery hypertension is. Whoa. No, no, no. Lord. Ductal dilatation. Okay. Ductal dilatation or ductal calcification or ductal aneurysm. If it is there, PDA is there. Okay. There are the diagnostic signs, but then how does the CT tell? How does the X-ray help you? How does the ECG help you? I think we'll take it because it is very difficult to answer that question. Seldom I ask that question, but almost always exam asks that question. How does the X-ray help you? What are the informations you will get? Sir, X-ray will be uh, the chamber enlargement. What chamber? Yeah. The... What chamber will you? Chamber. Which chamber? Which chamber? Right or left? There is LV enlargement. You can look for left atrial enlargement if it is there. You can yes. say a good left right shunt. Okay. Yes. Then the pulmonary artery size, pulmonary. the pulmonary uh-huh. flow, the PA pressure can be assessed. And as yes. I said, anatomical findings related to ductus, though not common, it is diagnostic. How yes. does the ECG help you? So the ECG uh, can help us with mm. which part of us? Uh, which Hemodynamic parameter, you will get better information from ECG. PA pressure. So you okay, have got RVH. LV okay, but if there is the, the RVH, the magnitude of the RVH as assessed by the QRS axis, all those things give us more information regarding the the pulmonary arterial pressure. Oh, so you true. have to assess the magnitude of the left right shunt, which can be assessed by radiology. And yes, magnitude of the PA pressure, which can be assessed radiologically, and maybe better by, by electrocardiogram. So you have to have correlation of these two physiologies in this case. What we want to know is what is the magnitude of the left right shunt, <coughs> what is the PA pressure or the PVR. So this is yes. the way by which you correlate. Go ahead. X-ray. Uh, this is uh, a chest X-ray PA view with uh, normal exposure, and uh, so it's. The cardiothoracic uh, r- ratio seems to be just about fifty percent. Normal or abnormal? That looks normal. Yes, normal. And uh, the uh, chambers, which chambers are dilated? No, no, just simple question: Is it a normal X-ray or abnormal X-ray? The cardiothoracic, uh, the cardiomegaly. You say it is an abnormal X-ray. Yes. Or a normal X-ray. That is the answer to the question. So, so cardiomegaly is <laughs> no. It is, is it present, sir. It is abnormal. No, no. Is it abnormal? What are yeah. what are the abnormalities you are seeing there? Okay. So there is cardiomegaly. Okay. Mm-hmm. And cardiomegaly, uh, severe cardiomegaly. This uh, seems mild, sir. Mild. What is your normal value? Sir, so, uh, the CT ratio more than fifty-five is suggest of cardiomegaly. More than fifty-five, or less than fifty-five? Is so it ratio fifty-five? ratio more than fifty-five to sixty is normal. No, that is abnormal. We are asking what is the normal? Okay, so then uh, cardiothoracic ratio of fifty. Cardiothoracic ratio fifty. Yeah. Okay. So here. Okay. However, the pulmonary arteries, any plethora, pruning, anything is there? Pulmonary artery. Mm-hmm. Now, is there a left to right shunt or no left to right shunt based on the chest X-ray? However, the right pulmonary artery. Do you see any pulmonary peripheral plethora is there? Any pruning also? Can you see? Where are the pulmonary arteries, Jeshu? On X-ray. Sorry, sir. Uh, I'm disconnected. 
sir uh, the pulmonary vasculature appears to be uh, plethoric and your criteria for that is uh, sir it is extending up to the third anything okay. else and also there appear to be uh, end on views uh, end on views of what uh, it just uh, just show with cursor up to, just trace the pulmonary arteries peripheral pulmonary arteries up to what level uh, i i cannot uh, move the cursor i think do you have a mouse there uh, no sir but i am not sharing the screen okay okay no no um, one you said was per, that the peripheral that the blood vessels are extending up to the periphery second okay. criteria by which you say there is plethora is you said something then, about end end on you said yes, end on what the end on is of the bronchial vessels bronchial mm -hmm. why will you see bronchial Bron राइट लंग अपियर्स टू बी मोर More yeah, plethoric okay. than the left. More vascular than the left lung in this X-ray. How do you explain that with your diagnosis? Mm. Uh. What will be the flow to the two lungs in a ductus arteriosus? What will be the flow? Will it be equal or more to the right lung, more to the left lung? So generally, the PD is more; it's slightly closer to the left pulmonary artery. But still, the pulmonary blood flow will be more to the right lung because actually okay. the pulmonary blood flow is norm is more to the right lung. But gross disparity will not be there. Then okay. here the problem is there is some problem in the exposure. If you look at the right lung, the right lung is more whitish compared to the left lung. So unless the exposure okay. is proper, it is not correct to interpret the vascularity. the vascularity assessment should be made based on a properly exposed x-ray here i think it is not proper because the right lung as a whole is uh, white the left lung there is some chest problem he has uh, some kyphoscolios all those things because the left intercostal spaces are wider compared to the right so that can produce some uh, differences uh, but still the problem is there is some um, reduction in the left is it a normal difference or is an exaggerate that is what sir is asking if it is really di dif uh, different what will you look for especially if the patient has a cataract something like that or some sensory neural deafness presuming you the diagnosis presuming your diagnosis of ductus is accepted how do you explain this unequal pulmonary vascularity right more than the left um no so answer is very simple either there is more blood flow to the right lung or there is less blood flow to the left lung which so means associate associate which means what pulmonary branch pulmonary so there may be pulmonary arterial stenosis to the left lung which is possible you know rubella syndrome for example right or unusual ductal direction Okay. normally duct is more directed towards the lpa lpa it attached beyond the bifurcation of the main main pulmonary artery yes some people it just arises at the junction of the mpa i mean junction of the rpa lpa near the bifurcation but angulated towards the right okay even <laughs> more rarely even more rarely it might be connected from right pulmonary artery to the descending thoracic cavity if that is so right okay. lung get more shunt than the left lung okay. how can you make okay. a difference uh, like if suppose if the patient is having a left pulmonary artery stenosis total compared to 
A branch stenosis, how do you differentiate by x-ray? If the branch stenosis, peripheral branch stenosis is there versus left main pulmonary artery stenosis. Whole lung will be a oligemic. Otherwise, okay. that also you have to see. Okay. So to the approach to the main for the pulmonary artery, I will just say, I, I think that the main pulmonary artery is dilated there. You can see that region is convex. That is just yes. below the iota, the pulmonary artery is convex and the iota is also prominent. Once the main pulmonary artery is dilated, look at right pulmonary artery. The right pulmonary artery, you should know the measurements at what point you have to measure. That is the right lower lobe bronchus you have to measure. It is dilated. If okay. the main pulmonary artery is dilated, and right pulmonary artery is also dilated, it indicates either an increase in the flow, increase in the pressure or combination. Once you have made that, you see what is the vascularity like. As you have rightly pointed out, the vessels are traceable up to the periphery and you are seeing sufficient number of endon vessels. The endon vessels are the vessels which are going andro-posterior. Yes. Here, this is a two-dimensional X-ray. So, the vessels which are going andro-posterior will be seen as a round spot. Just like take this pen, the pen is going like this, then it will be seen as long. But andro-posterior, you will see this round cross-section of that artery. Yes. So, it is the andro-cross-section of the pulmonary dilated pulmonary and arterial branches. When will yes. you say it is more? What Sir, there are is more than... than Five. Three on one side or normally, five in total? Normally, the diameter is less than three. Three to okay. five borderline, more than five is this thing. Or more than the diameter of the accompanying bronchus, the right. cross section of the bronchus. Second, the number, more than five in number in each lung field. And if it extends beyond the medial third of the hemithorax or the lung field, then you can say it is increased. So okay. here you have found the main pulmonary artery is prominent. The right pulmonary artery is prominent, the vessels are traceable up to the periphery and the end-on vessels are increased, so there is a good left-right change. Then on the asymmetry, we have already discussed. Is there any evidence of severe pH? In severe pH, the peripheral pruning will occur, which is not quite characteristic in this X-ray. Yes. Okay. Then, is, then you look at the iota. When there is a left-right shunt at the atrial level or at the ventricular level, the aortic flow is relatively less. So, the aorta will be unimpressive. If the aorta is fairly well seen, it is likely to be a patent ductus arteriosus or aortopulmonary communication. Okay. okay. You have to look in a good x-ray, what is the LA size? LA size also you have to look into. In a post-tricus patient, if there is a good uh, pulmonary blood flow, the LA will be marginally enlarged. So, you can look for that. Ready? One point which I might emphasize here is, yes. uh, radiologic radiologically, in a normal individual, there is a discontinuity between shadow of the aorta and the main pulmonary artery. But if there is a duct, duct is dilated. So, because the duct is dilated, there is a, I mean, this discontinuity is lost. It will appear as if aorta is continuing into the main pulmonary artery. That radiological discontinuity of aorta to pulmonary artery is lost. So, that is one important radiological finding of a duct. Second thing is, we need to differentiate between AP window and PDA. All other findings may look similar except the aorta. In duct, ascending aorta, arch, and descending aorta up to the duct are dilated, whereas in AP window, only ascending aorta is dilated. Okay. So, what do you think is the degree of the shunt based on this x ray? Uh, there is uh, increase. There is cardiomegaly and increased pulmonary blood flow. No, no, no. That's my question to you. Can you quantify the shunt? Is it more than two is to one or less than two is to one? Like that. So, okay. So more than two is to one. So at what level of the shunt does the X-ray become abnormal in terms of vascularity? So. More than two is to one. 
More than two is to one. Thank you. Usually it is said that you can pick up the shunt. Yeah. If you were curious, 1.2 is to one by oximetry. 1.5 okay. is to one by chest X-ray. Two okay. is to one by clinical examination by the presence of mid-diastolic mound. This is the classical teaching. So if the, if the shunt is more than 20 percent, that is QP by QS more than 1 is 1.2, then you can detect it by oximetry. Indirectly meaning that if the shunt is small, you, will, you may not pick up by oximetry. Yes. So the chest X-ray becomes abnormal when the shunt is more than 1.5 is 2. Okay. And clinically, you will find an MDM at the mitral area in case of post tricuspid shunt if the shunt is more than 2 is 2. Okay. But you need to remember all these signs which are dis being discussed are relevant to isolated pure PDA. Yeah. Can we go on to the ECG? ECG we have not seen. Yeah. We'll show you the ECG. Uh, we are, uh, check the ECG. Yes. Okay, sir. No, no, I, no. I don't have it. No, we have got it. Okay. Yeah, just a reverse. Ask them to make it reverse. clockwise rotation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dead. Clockwise rotation. Yeah. 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 That's it. That's it. Okay. Uh, this is a four channel 12 lead ECG with normal standardization in sinus rhythm with a rate of around uh, 80 beats per minute with the normal uh, P wave axis. With the you can't say normal, madam, you have to say degrees. A P wave axis around 60 degrees plus 60 minus, degrees. Is it minus 60 or plus 60? Uh, plus. Sir. Yeah, you have to say it properly. Plus, uh, sorry, plus 60 degrees. Mm -hmm. And uh, with the... Right. So there is a left atrial enlargement. I and, think it, uh, it is safer for you to say now, left atrial abnormality. Is it rather than left. anything else. Okay. Uh, is it by So, QRS sorry, axis? Sir? The QRS axis is uh, why so much time for the fundamentals? Yes. So it is a uh, it's around uh, 90 plus 90 degrees. 90 degrees. Mm -hmm. yes. Go ahead. Why do you say it is 90 degrees? Why do you say it is 90 degrees? So the uh, QRS appears to be biphasic in lead one. Don't say biphasic, it is equiphasic. Equiphasic in lead one. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, and so there is uh, there are signs of. So sorry, one. Biventricular hypertrophy. Biventricular hypertrophy. Yeah. And. Uh, what is your criteria to say biventricular hypertrophy on this ECG? Sir, uh, the, by the cat's vatural phenomenon in V3 and V4, there are the equiphasic uh, QRS complexes measuring more than 50 mm in height. Are you sure? V4 it is not 50. Sir, V4 at most is 15, 20. It's not 50. Is that it? Okay. okay. Answer is correct only. V3, okay. there is a problem is, um, <laughs> there is a... Overlap, overlap. Is, uh, standardization. Not yeah. that. You do overlap. There is an overlap. There is overlap. Is and, uh, R, we were, but still V3, I think the R is not that tall, deep is. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. You can't say that. Definitely not. Uh, which is likely to be dominant. The, uh, sorry, sir? Which ventricle is likely to be dominant in this? Equal the left ventricle, left ventricle forces 
in a large left right chain b6 b5 are you happy no so i would have expected a uh, q wave with the taller uh, taller r wave t and taller r wave and axis has got plus 90 near plus yes, 90 so you can say that the axis has gone to plus 90 but then yes. what the q waves why does q point? waves are present in inferior inferior but not seen in v5 v6 v5 v6 yes, v5 v6 does it help you because if there is a good left right change you expected a volume load of the left ventricle and you expected a q in 2 3 avf am i right uh, sorry in v5 v6 but you can say that there is a septal vector in v1 okay v1 shows an initial rv what is the relevance of that especially raju sir initially made one differential diagnosis the importance of the q wave presence or absence absence of a q wave in, in a patient who has got a large left to right chain it if there is a q wave in v5 v6 one of the diagnosis which sir has initially said when That's he discuss about the parasternal heave all those things that is less likely septal vector going septal vector going in the opposite direction so ventricle might have been inverted but then the problem is there is corrected transposition in corrected transposition ventricle is inverted so the normal septal vector am, vector is altered but uh, you if it is there q in v5 v6 is there you can say there is no ventricular inversion but in this case the problem is there is an initial septal normal vector in v1 so there is a difficulty you cannot be adamant on that presence of q in v5 v6 uh, you can say it is less likely to be corrected transposition of great arteries absence of uh, q waves in presence of left ventricular volume overload there is one thing where you may suspect corrected transposition suppose there is a large vsd there is a left ventricular volume overload severe mitral regurgitation with left ventricular volume overload there you find there is no q waves that is one situation where you have to look for corrected transposition you need not be right so septal q you should see what is the vector like septal vector like okay So, yeah, so, do you think it is PDA with the, what is the assessment? PDA clinically there is a continuous murmur, so you feel there is a good left right change. Radiologically there is a left right change. The axis is near plus ninety, so it may indicate that there is some degree of pH. You have parasternal heave also. Okay. Do you want to give commentary, madam, on this pending commentary on this echocardiogram? Read echo findings. Kavya, situs. Unmute, I think. I think you are muted. You are. You have to okay, unmute yeah. your. Sorry, sorry, sir. It's uh, showing situs solitus, and it's showing the. Uh, IVC is draining into the right right atrium. This is a parasternal long axis view, which is showing. Uh, <laughs> parasternal long axis view. Can you show again? Yes. Uh, okay. Please, please. What is happening the there? Mitral valve appears to be doming. Yeah. Doming might move it. Move freely, and then you yeah. Please, please, please. Okay. So But can I see a parachute mitral valve from looking at it? Move it and yes. move it and don't say like that. Move it, yeah. Can. Very distinctive motion. Think of it. Then consider I think Luton Bashir as a cause of continuous murmur. Also, we consider the differential diagnosis of continuous murmur, MS with ASD. But that doesn't okay. produce continuous murmur because the ASD is non-restrictive, and uh, there is no gradient. 
when there is mitrostenosis with a, a PFO or a restrictive ways in rectal communication, you can have. But the murmur will be in the right sternal border. That's right. Second right sternal. Yeah. It depends upon the size of ASD, sir. Yeah, that's right. The severity of MS and size of ASD. Yeah, that's right. MS is severe and the ASD is a smaller model. Then you can have a murmur. Restrictive ASD. The murmur will be around the right sternal border rather than the second space. Yeah. Want to comment on the on the M mode echocardiogram here? Mm, sir, the M mode across the mitral valve is showing. Uh, no, identify the structures, madam, first. Yes, with okay. cancer, identify what is a, where is AML, PML, and uh, no, what are the structures from anterior to posterior? So from anterior to posterior, if there is the RV, RV uh, OD. And then the interventricular septum, then there is the LV cavity, mm -hmm. and then there's the anterior mitral leaflet, and the posterior mitral leaflet, then the posterior ventricular septum and the pericardium. Posterior ventricular septum. Posterior sorry, posterior ventricular wall. Okay. And so the com pericardium. The comment about the mitral apparatus. So the uh, AML seems to we have some fluttering movements. Is it thickened or not thickened? Uh, it ap appears to be not thickened, sir. Not thickened. Thick. Okay. Then what is the normal thickness of mitral valve? Sir, uh, less, less than uh, what 4 ml. What view you will measure the thickness of the mitral valve and what is the normal thickness of the mitral valve in an adult? So in the parasternal long axis view, and up to 4 you mm. Is it in diastole or systole or mid-diastole or mid-systole? Diastole, mid-diastole. Mid-diastole? Where do you measure? No, that's not mid-diastole. Oh. When it is actually parallel to the septum, that is fully opened mitral valve. Okay. But where do you measure? Which part of mitral valve will you measure? Tip, belly, or base? Tip. Not sure. You say not sure. Not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Very <laughs> obvious. So you might not have read this thing. That is the thing. You should know <laughs> that these areas, I am not sure. Don't uh, guess. You will be making okay. mistakes. You can then what about the motion of these leaflets, mitral valve leaflets here? Anterior leaflet, posterior leaflet. How are they? What is the motion of normal? Appears, appears, leaflet? and the posterior uh, leaflet oh, yeah. is also moving anteriorly. No, 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 certainly not. We just watched the last two views of the M mode of the mitral wall. Look at the posterior leaflet of the. Yeah, we just mark the you know. I, I will just show you the place. Yeah. What do you think is this? Mm. Is it anteriorly or posteriorly? No, sir. There is posterior. Posterior. Suppose if it is moving anteriorly, what does that indicate? Sir, in uh, severe MS, severe no, mitral no, no, stenosis. I am not asking under what conditions. Okay. What makes it move anteriorly? In yeah. dash. Is it the cuspal fusion, commissural fusion, caudal fusion? Commissural. <laughs> yeah. Why are you hesitating so much? I, oh, I, I am that the, you know, that the reason for hesitancy about the fundamentals it makes the okay. makes the things very difficult. It's but about the, uh, identify the various components of the M mode echo of the mitral wall. Various components, A, B, C, D, E, F. Yes, sir. so the first, the first point will be the D no, point. Okay. Oh. I, I just the curve. Yeah. Okay. What is this point? So that is D. That is D. Yes. That is, is e, e, e point. What is this slope for? That is the E F slope. E F slope here is normal or abnormal? Mm, sir, so it's looking abnormal. What is the normal? It looks free. So it should be 
early dash okay what next after the e and f what ends next e, next then is said a point a a point is there a is there a, a wave there or no a wave there so uh, said it is there it is there certainly i cannot see it and you can see it in the first uh, complex and third complex okay. yeah but in the first complex is probably there yes. what does that indicate sir uh for no, that you should know the normal mechanism of the ef slope and the a wave yeah that is a main thing the ef slope and the a wave the mechanism which is related to the flow and what is happening to that that you should learn so okay. i am happy that she answered atrial filling phase what is the diastasis and atrial filling those things you have to describe so what is a b wave so the b bump will be present if there is a uh, diastolic no 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 diastolic e wave is there so i have a b bump if there is diastolic this so have a b bump it means the left ventricular end diastolic pressure diastolic is more than pressure. 25 okay more than 25 what is l wave yeah. l wave i don't know not n it is l l, l. l. I, i don't know yeah l m n l l wave you have heard of it no sir yeah but you people can interpret the coronary angiogram very well but you have a difficulty in fundamental echocardiogram sir but okay. sir i have a comment i am yeah. very happy with her because i have interrogated <laughs> many post graduates majority of them has no idea about the mod echocardiogram of the mitral valve and the pulmonary valve i am sure sure that at least she has mentioned all the wave forms <laughs> i am really impressed with that okay uh, okay but don't get excited with my stay <laughs> <laughs> What is abnormal? What what is abnormal on of CD segment in this record? Mitral valve CD, CD segment is it normal or abnormal? abnormal? If it is abnormal, what is abnormal? If it is so, what does it signify? What does CD segment represent? <laughs> Systolic. Systolic. Oh yeah. Systolic. Systolic. Yes. No, as one of the professor of physiology used to say, don't say systole and diastole. Nothing is stole. It's called systolic. 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 Yeah, systolic. Diastole. Another. So another malady here. Echo is. Is there no malady? Chambers, right wind to left wind to. What do you think? Because sir, systematically said, start from top. Did you find something about the R V L V ratio? Do you think it is normal? I think R V O T almost equal. But it is dilated. The right one, please. You can dilated. see the 2D as well as in this thing. You can see the R V is dilated. Okay. Yes, sir. Fine. What about R V free wall? Is it thickened? Is there R V H? You are seeing the R V free wall there. Yes, What is the normal thickness of RV free wall? Sorry, sir. What is the normal thickness of LV free wall? So LV free wall is uh, less than less than twelve mm. Less than twelve mm. So if it is eleven mm, it is abnormal. This is the normal is up to twelve mm. Normal is not up to twelve. Certainly not. Sorry. I think Kavya, I think you are even material thickness also. You told four mm. Okay, three mm is taken as the upper limit, and three to okay. five when you are doing the Wilkins classification. Okay, three to okay. five considered as as one, and again five to eight as two more five than two. three. Okay, so you know the classification and know the one. And even okay. simply for LV wall thickness, what sir is asking is, I think one point one is taken as the upper limit. Anything above one point one is considered abnormal. Okay. Okay. So posterior wall or the IBS also. And in fact, some books have been posterior wall even at one point zero as the upper limit, not even one. Okay. 
वन पॉइंट वन फॉर आईवीएस एंड वन पॉइंट जीरो फॉर पोस्टेज वॉल आई थिंक दिस थिंग्स यू हैव टू रिमेम्बर नार यू थ्री वॉल थिकनेस एंड एवरीथिंग इज गिवन बट यू हैव टू रिमेम्बर ऑल दिस बिकॉज़ यू आर गोइंग टू बी आस्किंग एक्चुअली नाउ द साइंटिफिक वे ऑफ डूइंग इट इज टेकिंग द जी स्कोर का दिस थिंग्स वेरी फ्रॉम रेस टू रेस जेंडर एंड आल्सो एज ग्रुप so g score is considered yes, to be yes. this standard now any idea what is g yeah. c score i hope she knows about the other score z z score is uh, is i am not sure how to play are you from adult cardiology or pediatric cardiology adult cardiology <laughs> you are excused then <laughs> adult cardiology is discussing with geriatric cardiologist am i right okay <laughs> Fine. Now let us go ahead. Okay. Okay. Your comment on this uh, cross section. This is a short axis parastern and short axis view at the level of the mitral valve. Oh. Uh, Not really. Okay. Except. So the. What is that structure? So the anterior mitral leaflet is. So can go can you go back sir yep. sir anterior you don't have a good picture so don't try to comment on very short frames okay okay Hey, whatever you can see now. Just okay, so it. the pulmonary artery appears to be dilated, main pulmonary artery, and uh, uh, there is a patent duct ductus arteriosus. No, no, no! Don't say ductus arteriosus. Just describe what you are finding there first. Okay, so there is yeah. a dilated pulmonary uh, main pulmonary artery with the uh, with an increased turbulence. What is happening there, sir? Color flow. आर्टरी Descending thoracic aorta, descending abdominal aorta. <laughs> descending thoracic aorta. Upper descending thoracic aorta, middle or lower descending thoracic aorta. You need to be exact. The upper, okay. Upper descending thoracic aorta to the main pulmonary artery. So direction of the flow, right to left, left to right, posterior to anterior, anterior to posterior. <laughs> Direction of flow uh, seems to be from left to right, sir. Okay. Direction of flow is posterior to anterior, descending thoracic aorta into main pulmonary artery. Okay, sir. So the flow is posterior to anterior. Okay. It's very important to distinguish it from AP window, and also all kappa. Okay. AP window will be from aorta to pulmonary artery, right? Yes. So based sir. on this, on this Doppler flow profile. Alpha also is side to side from the other side, but not posterior anterior. Okay. Based on the Doppler flow, how much yes, is the gradient between the aorta and pulmonary artery? Or you have to tell what is the PA pressure in this case. So the PA pressure would be one fifty minus yeah, forty around forty around thirty eight I think that is around forty so hundred and okay. you have to give PA systolic pressure PA diastolic pressure yeah yeah okay so, so the system you can say that I am not happy with the trace I want to have a better <laughs> trace that you have to tell because the pressure the tracing has to be. Very no, no, no. Good. I think the I think the first two cycles pressure yeah, that's fine. pressure tracing is quite good. There is no problem. Highest value. You take the highest value. Hmm. Doppler. Doppler. Yeah. Okay. Leave so it there. Okay. Okay. So, so the uh, systolic uh, 
pulmonary artery pressure would be around 100 uh, what is the velocity mercury 3.5 3.6 3.6 will come to pressure gradient in 52 mm so it is 100 100 diastolic is 100 diastolic so diastolic it's not this so is gradient this gradient. is gradient so he has reduced the 50 from 150 the blood pressure was 150 so yes. he reduced that so 100 not 100 diastolic will be ask them to bring it to end diastolic so can you can you may it's about 2 with the cost Two, it six, was around two. 12 i think okay that means mm. okay let us say it is 20 it will come to 70 am i right Seven, yes sir so pulmonary artery pressure you are seeing it as 100 by 70 mm of mercury yes okay let us verify that later is there duct and um, cord This is. So this is still the ductal view. Ask for a supra. Yeah, I would want to see supra sternal view for. Okay. For coagulation. See, whenever you find one congenital heart disease, always look for its companions, because very yes. frequently they are a group of disorders. you have to account for each structure in the cardiovascular system in a congenital heart disease literally every structure okay so we have got ad adequate information from that view so we will go to the next view okay you have described the duct what is the type of duct vertical duct oblique duct right duct left duct Vegetation is present, absent. Valves uh, times are present in the duct, rarely. So, are there any valves in the duct? What is the size of the duct? Suppose if you want to devise close it, you need all this information. What yeah. is the length of the duct? What is the width of the duct? Are Don't the come to the aortic valve. Aortic valve. So the aortic valve uh, is bicus bicus okay. valve. Okay. And we can uh, see the okay origin of the coronary also. Yes. Yeah. Oh, even yeah. the left. See that left coronary. Yes, sir. Both yes, sir. Anterior sinus. Okay. Yes. So good. So the the apical four chamber view. The. I, the interatrial septum looks aneurysmal. The right. Why do you say aneurysmal? Uh, is that correct statement? <laughs> What is your definition of aneurysm of IAS? So it is bulging into the right atrium. Certainly not. That is not the definition. If bulging means uh, even with LA pressure, more also. Okay, yeah. Can somebody please there? This is a parachute mitral valve. Well. You see that? Okay, yes, sir. Do you agree? Yes, sir. This is a very typical parachute mitral valve. You have to check papillary muscles. If yeah, it was. It was one, only one action. Or two pap muscles, or there is one dominant pap muscle. The other pap muscle is uh, indistinct. But in this view, you are able to see a classical parachute mitral valve. What is the gradient here? N D six by the mean gradient is fourteen. Okay. You should ask for the heart rate also. Okay. Whenever you are measuring, you should ask for the heart rate. Okay. Okay. Fine. So you have something on the left side. You have picked up doctors. You have picked up the mitral abnormality. Okay. Uh, so what else? Yeah, bicuspid. Bicuspid valve abnormality. Bicuspid. Yeah. And you also have something else. Yeah. No, no, no. Not only PA. And then the left side there is there is something else. Yeah. Cord. Yeah. You yeah. have to look for cord. Yeah. Hmm. What is the level of cord? 
ിലേറ്റ് <laughs> Clavian is dilated. Yeah. And now the like that duct spine. Something is post for the spine you can see. You are having a high pressure in the legs. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of higher pressure no, in the upper limbs the and lower limbs, the pressure appears yes. to be almost the same in upper and lower. The reason being duct is below the <laughs> part. Right. Okay. No, no, but once you close the ductus, the coarctation might look much much tighter than what it is now so we need to be very careful about closure what was the gradient what was the coarct gradient got coarct millimeters coarct zero. gradient is not very much it's only it about 30 or 40 four zero. it was 40 zero shown there now 40 zero just uh, so if you close this shunt probably 40 zero will become 20 zero yeah yeah, yeah. But still, these days, even two zero is considered significant by pediatric cardiologists. Oh, yeah. Indication for intervention. Now, uh, anything else you want to see? LVOT. So, if there is a cord, <coughs> the PDA. If there is a solitary papillary, I mean parachute mitral valve. Uh, you have to look for left atrial membrane. You have to look for LVOT ridge or membrane. that is to look for shons complex shons complex yes right uh, yes. did you find the papillary muscles they i don't know whether they have shown the shots yes. of the papillary muscles i think we are getting late now so yeah. we will wind up with some words some discussion on the management uh, uh, what is the diagnosis of the pediatric cardiologist here i see but, dr but but Sorry? i would like to know what is the rv pressure by the other things also because the uh, tricuspidic agitation if you can pick up because not relying too much on the pda gradient you have to have other measures also because by looking at the pda gradient the pressure is quite high okay so it is something like that by 70 she has got so there is a significant uh, ph it is subsystemic but ph is there okay. the blood okay. pressure okay. Is because the classically the uh, the uh, the asymmetry is lost when it is a juxta ductal coarctation this is a anatomically it looks like a pre ductal coarctation so we have to check the blood pressure again in the lower limb what was the blood pressure in the lower limb it was second 160 sir once you have to check again usually we have a habit of uh, modifying that the ribbit is 150 we write it as 160 now you have to check again okay okay fine because the what is the diagnosis of the pediatric cardiologist shall i ask one more question what is the next investigation you will do in this case uh to image the vessels i have given you the clue sir uh, angiography before that non invasive oh. nowadays angiogram is seldom done you have other non invasive what oh. about mri mri ct mri ct yeah that will give us a clear idea about the ductus the type of ductus the anatomical location of these things mri can give us an idea about all the other intracardiac abnormalities okay and yes. never forget to look for a vsd also in this case we may miss these things so you should be careful in these things okay there are three things are not yet demonstrated in this study one is whether there is any supramitral ring or membrane and the lvot ridge or membrane uh, these uh, and also the papillary muscles 
whether it is single solitary papillary muscle or two papillary muscles which are one is dominant the other one is uh, redundant uh, they are not demonstrated and the pulmonary arteries in intrapulmonary pulmonary arteries main pulmonary arteries we have seen but we haven't seen the uh, i mean second level third level pulmonary arteries so some of this information we can have on uh, particularly ct Okay. So you should ask for CT rather than invasive angiogram. No, no, it will be. Uh, I think uh, the patient is processed for CT, CT yeah. angio, but I think uh, they are slightly reluctant to get investigated at this some um, this point of time. Okay. For social reasons, and uh, probably we will have more data probably next month. Dasagar, what is the diagnosis of pediatric department? Pediatric department is uh, PDA plus cooptation uh, plus uh, possible shown complex. Uh, what about? Uh, yeah, I mean, I uh, think a PDA coart then mitral valve. Yeah, shown complex. That is a uh, uh, what do you call? It? Yeah. That's Unfortunately, I think uh, Sudeep has gone for an emergency uh, sir is it possible to make a diagnosis of shorts complex in the absence of uh, subalar membrane no 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 we are not telling that it is shorts complex yeah. we are only multiple left sided obstructions left side obstruction. yeah starting from uh, mitral oh. wall we are, we are not really looked at supra wall supra wall uh, uh, ridges or anything like that uh, unfortunately sudeep has got all the data but unfortunately he has left for an emergency so in a Don't you don't need to have all of them? Only two or three also, sir. So no. two, then you could call it as a shunt complex. If there are two obstructive lesions, two or more obstructive lesions on the left side, you can call it as a shunt complex. And there can be associations of other lesions also. The quartz is commonly there. Then you have a bicuspid aortic valve. You have the parachute mitral valve. So that is enough to label it as um, a shunt complex. But rather than putting a Stone's complex, going for the other detailed evaluation, we have to describe all the anatomical components of that entity. That is a present status. Describe all the anatomical com uh, components with the physiology also. So we have to put coarctation of aorta, uh, parachute mitral valve with mitral stenosis or obstruction. Grade up that you have to write. Then large ductus arteriosus, left right flow, pulmonary arterial hypertension, and certain other things have to be evaluated. And uh, this is the way we have to write descriptive diagnosis is what is increased now. Hey, thank you, Kavya, for your uh, presentation. I think, uh, shall I make a comment? Thank you, sir. She has, she has been confident in uh, dealing the case in presentation, but don't get uh, elated by my statements. So she has been confident. She was not anxious, and only thing she ventured to answer questions, uh, the answer which she was not sure. No confidence is okay. We appreciate, but you need to be confident and right. <laughs> okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah, they have given a uh, senior teachers have given a right direction. You have one more year. You are a second year, but uh, no, no, no. but she has done. She has done very well. Yeah, she has uh, done well. Considering that uh, she is only second year student, she has done. Yeah, well, definitely. Well. We appreciate her. She came forward. Uh, Willing to present the case, uh, I really like the spirit of presentation for her. Give us, a, give her a bonus mark for that. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity. Okay. Sure. Thank you. We should thank you for as a good patient yes. and describing it well. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Sir. We have uh, the final uh, talk uh, by Dr. Ka, Dr. Um, Sonali Arora, uh, she is our uh, transplant uh, specialist uh, in cardiology department, and she is going to present uh, the state of art of cardiac transplantation in India. We are not going to talk about every other country, but she is going to present our data in this forum. Dr. Sonali, are you ready? Uh, yes, sir. Thank you Thank so you. much. You. Give me one second. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
does uh, can everyone see my slides yeah slides are visible and, and am i uh, audible no the clearly audible go ahead ma'am okay thank you so much for giving me this opportunity uh, my name is sonali arora i'm the transplant cardiologist i'm going to uh, present um, on current status of heart transplantation in india uh, i don't have any disclosures uh, i'm going to start with a brief clinical case uh, we had a 66 year old male with history of non hodgkin's lymphoma treated with chemo and radiation therapy about 20 years ago diagnosed with uh, dilated cardiomyopathy about 6 years ago uh, he has an icd for ventricular tachycardia so secondary prophylaxis on guideline directed medical therapy he was on um, arni but it was stopped due to aki and now he is on isolazine and beta blocker his ecg shows sinus tachycardia and right bundle branch block coronary angiogram shows mild cad uh, which was medically treated he has been having shortness of breath and lower extremity edema has had three admissions for acute decompensated heart failure one of them requiring inotropes recently had an icd shock for ventricular tachycardia and he was started on amiodarone he has been referred for advanced heart failure therapies evaluation uh, on exam his blood pressure is usually at 90 by 65 heart rate in 110 sinus rhythm oxygen saturation normal his jvd is at the angle of jaw he has a systolic murmur of mitral regurgitation he does have lower extremity edema plus 2 and cool peripheries bilaterally he mentions he now has nausea and abdominal bloating and he has reduced appetite and has lost about 5 to 6 kgs His echocardiogram shows severe LV dysfunction. LV IDD is 6.8 cm with global hypokinesis. RV is dilated, TAPSI is reduced. He has moderate to severe MR which is functional because of a dilated LV. Moderate TR, RV SP is 60 with a right atrial pressure of between 15 to 20. His IVC is plethoric more than 2.1 um and not collapsible. We did a six-minute walk test to see his functional evaluation. We did not do a max VO2 because he has had VT recently, which is a relative contraindication to do max VO2. He was able to walk 210 meters, which was 40 percent predicted for his age. His creatinine, when I saw him, was 1.8. Um, he had an elevated NT-pro BNP. LFTs were within normal limits. We did a right heart cath, which showed elevated biventricular filling pressures. Uh, his RA was about 20. His wedge pressure was 28. He had low cardiac output and cardiac index was 1.3. PVR was 3 wood units. We diuresed him with Lasix and Milrinone as he was symptomatic, and we also wanted to see if his creatinine would get better. His creatinine came down to 1.1 in 48 hours. He also had other evaluations, including nephrology, because of his raised creatinine. Who um, said this was low cardiac, uh, cardiorenal because of low output? And oncology also saw him, who uh, did a PET scan. He had a lymph node enlargement in his right axillary lymph node, which was actually biopsied and it was reactive. A multidisciplinary meeting uh, was done, um, and we all, we thought of advanced heart failure therapies, including LVAD, which is left ventricular assist device, or cardiac transplantation. The right side of his heart was weak, with a creatinine of one point eight at the age of sixty uh, six. We were not very confident that he would be okay with only a left ventricular assist device support. Thus, decision was to do a heart transplantation. Um, Of course, there was question about his history of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, but it was 20 years ago with a PET scan, which did not show um, any recurrence. Of course, the risk of having non-Hodgkin's lymphoma would increase after being on immunosuppressants, which was discussed with the patient. Um, he underwent heart transplant about a month later after discussing all these risks, and he was discharged on post-op day 13, and he came for his first review um, actually today. So he's doing well, but of course, it's too. soon and the most important thing for him would be his renal function as he's he's going to be on a calcineurin inhibitor which is tacrolimus as well as a long term complication of being on immunosuppressants um, where non hodgkin lymphoma is in the history so i just wanted to um discuss this case before i discuss other things in my talk so the objectives of our talk would be to understand the history historical perspective of cardiac transplantation which is always important to start with when we are talking about um where we are at right now to discuss current status of heart transplantation in india logistics and challenges 
to understand indications, contraindications of heart transplantation, and to understand post-transplant surveillance and complications in order to improve the outcomes. Epidemiology of advanced heart failure. Heart failure has a global prevalence of over 26 million. Severe advanced heart failure is estimated to be 1 to 2 million worldwide. And these patients are at high risk of death, which is up to 75% in one year in the, in the absence of advanced heart failure therapies, which could be either VAD or a cardiac transplant. It's been more than 50 years of heart transplantation. First successful human orthotopic heart transplant was performed by eminent Dr. Christian Bernard in Cape Town, South Africa on 3rd December 1967. Recipient was a middle-aged male with advanced ischemic cardiomyopathy and a donor was a young woman who was a victim of a road traffic accident. Patient survived for 18 days and ultimately died of pneumonia. The first heart transplant in the United States was performed at Stanford University just about a month later. Over next one year, 100 cardiac transplants were performed globally. Initial outcomes were plagued by cardiac graft rejection and graft failure, which was inadequately understood at that time. So as everyone knows, this is Dr. Christian Bernard on the left, and this is uh, Dr. Norman Shambhe from Stanford. Dr. Shamfei did pioneering work to diagnose acute cardiac rejection, which improved mortality in 49% survival at six months and 30% at two years. In 1973, Stanford Group instituted use of routine and frequent endomyocardial biopsy in the post-transplant phase for histological confirmation of rejection and appropriate use of immunosuppression, which was a great development in the field of transplant cardiology. Another important advancement was in vitro development of cyclosporin A. By 1985, one-year survival rates of 83% were achieved as a result of standardized post-transplant care and improved immunosuppression to prevent rejection. So we basically have two techniques of um, heart transplantation surgically, which is orthotopic and heterotopic transplantation. Um, donor heart usually when placed in the correct anatomical position by removing the recipient heart is called orthotopic transplantation. Heterotopic transplantation is when the recipient heart is left in C2 and the donor heart is piggybacked to the recipient organ and placed to the right side of the recipient heart. Rationale is that the donor heart functions as an assist heart for the recipient. And the first heterotopic heart transplantation was performed by Dr. Bernard in 1974 to function as a left as a biventricular assist device. This was done as the patient had um, you know, severe biventricular uh, dysfunction. It was also thought at that time if the, um, the, the donor if the donor heart failed, the recipient heart would be continued to work. Um, in case there is acute rejection. Of course, uh, subsequently heterotopic transplantations mm -hmm. fall out of, fell out of favor as the incomes were inferior as compared to orthotopic heart transplantation. So as you can see here, this is the heterotopic um, heart transplantation where this is the uh, donor heart and there is the um, dilated uh, heart, which is um, the recipient heart, which is not removed. Surgical technique, techniques of orthotopic heart transplantation are basically um, two techniques. It used to be biatrial transplantation, where excision of the native heart while leaving behind a cuff of right and left atrium, as well as the aorta and pulmonary artery. Donor heart is then anastomosed to the native left atrial cuff, and the donor right atrium is anastomosed to the native right atrium, such as the native SVC and IVC drain bl blood into the donor heart. Suture lines along the right atrium running vertically from SVC to IVC and those in the posterior left atrium are sites of incisional atrial arrhythmias when biatrial transplantation was done. And there is a higher rate of sinoatrial node injury from the right atrial anastomosis and a permanent pacemaker implantation up to 10%. Thus, a switch was made from the biatrial technique to a bicable technique where the recipient right atrium is fully excised and the recipient vena cavae are anastomosed to the donor right atrium. So as you can see here, this is the biatrial uh, technique of heart transplantation. Uh, Bicable bi technique was developed in 1990s. Native SVC and IVC are divided and sutured to the donor cable atrial junctions, as I said. It showed actually improved 30-day survival and lower rates of permanent pacemaker implantation. Thus, in 2021 and for the last many, many years, bicable technique has been the standard um, technique for surgical transplantation for heart transplant. This is the bicable uh, technique of orthotopic transplantation here. 
And as you can see, this is the uh, orthotopic heart transplantation and this is the heterotopic transplantation. So the current status of heart transplantation in India. The first heart transplant in India was performed by, in 1968, which was unsuccessful. First yeah. successful heart transplant in India was performed by Dr. Venugopal at Ames in 1994. Transplant volumes remain low until the past decade. Steady rise in transplant numbers in South India, where donations are, readily, are more readily available. A major impetus for organ transplantation in India was provided by a national organ and tissue transplant organization, which is called NOTO, which was set up in 2014. The goal was to integrate data from state level organ donation programs and create a national donor and recipient registry to achieve transplant allocation. NOTO functions as something like United Network of Organ Sharing, which is a UNO system in the United States. As per 2018, there were two, uh, 241 heart transplants done that year as per the data from NOTO. NOTO emphasizes three categories of patients for organ allocation, which is emergent, semi-emergent and elective, which is different from the UNOS classification where there are five systems. There are state level government organizations also, which work and complement with NOTO regional authorities to further strengthen transplant allocation. These have been, these mm -hmm. have been called, as you must all be familiar with, is Jeevandal in Telangana, Transtan in Tamil Nadu and etc. So challenges for transplantation Very still high. high, which is low levels of awareness responsible for organ donor pools, and which is the main reason of low volumes of cardiac transplants and also um, wasting of many good donor hearts as the counseling to the donor family and also the logistics are not able to be um, uh, fulfilled. Intercity and intracity organ transport can be challenging, but recently green corridors have been arranged in increasing numbers, which has been very beneficial and also helps in reducing the ischemic time. Rigorous protocols for post-transplant rejection surveillance are not followed well, um, mainly because of lack of awareness and also because of financial challenges. A public-private partnership is one solution to overcome some of these barriers and non-governmental organizations such as Mohan Foundation who have been advocating for improved coordination, awareness and arranging financial aid. Let's talk a little bit about ischemic time and organ preservation which are important logistically um, uh, for a transplant. When the donor heart is procured, it is arrested with cold cardioplegia and then transported in an ice box. Time taken from the donor heart arrest to the reperfusion in the recipient's body is called the ischemic time. Aim is to keep the ischemic time less than four hours, particularly for older donors because it predicts mortality. Various cardioplegic solutions have been studied to rapidly achieve non-contractility and minimize tissue ischemia. One of the solutions are University of Wisconsin solution, which is very expensive. And the other solution is custodial, HTK, which is histidine, tryptophan, and ketoglutarate solution, which are extracellular solutions, which have a low sodium concentration and high potassium content, which leads to cellular depolarization and diastolic arrest. In our program at KIMS as well, we used a custodial solution. Let's talk to indi about indications of cardiac transplantation. Absolute indications of cardiac transplantation are hemodynamic compromise due to heart failure, which is refractory cardiogenic shock, documented dependence on IV inotropic support to maintain adequate organ perfusion, peak VO2 less than 10 ml per kg minute with achievement of anaerobic metabolism, severe limiting symptoms of ischemia that are not amenable to coronary artery bypass surgery or PCI, recurrent symptomatic ventricular arrhythmias, uh, refractory to the therapeutic modalities. Relative indications for cardiac transplantations would be a peak VO2 of 11 to 14 and major limitation of the patient's daily activities, recurrent unstable ischemia, uh, not amenable to uh, other intervention, recurrent instability of fluid balance, renal function, not due to patient non-compliance with medical regimen. Insufficient indications for cardiac transplantation is low left ventricular ejection fraction only is not an indication enough for cardiac transplant. History of functional class three or four symptoms of heart failure is itself alone is not a some indication for cardiac transplant unless there are other um, symptoms. Peak VO2 greater than 15 is not an indication unless there are other symptoms. Mm -hmm. 
So the most common clinical phenotypes which we see are progressive advanced heart failure, failing outpatient therapies and requiring frequent hospitalization and or chronic inotropes and acute decompensation with cardiogenic shock of a patient with known uh, advanced heart failure or de novo cardiogenic shock that requires urgent cardiac transplantation with or without mechanical circulatory support. Let's talk to look, talk about Intermax classification, which is the interagency um, inter mechanical assisted circulatory support classification. There are seven categories, which is one to seven, one being critical cardiogenic shock and seven being advanced NYHA class three. Critical cardiogenic shock or crash and burn patient are the patients which have life-threatening hypertension and refractory to inotropes. Intermax 2 is a patient who is progressively declining, who is sliding on inotropes. IV inotropes are required with worsening end organ function. Intermax 3 are inotropic dependent patients, which is dependent stability, that they have stable blood pressure and end organ function, but failure to wean from IVC inotropes, uh, from IV inotropes. Resting symptoms, uh, Intermax 4 on oral therapy, which is a frequent flyer patient who comes for admissions or OPD basis, who have daily symptoms of congestion at rest or with ADLs and high dose of diuretics. Intermax 5 is exercise intolerant, which is housebound patient unable to engage in um, any activity, ADLs. Uh, Intermax 6 is Exertion limited, which is walking wounded, can participate in minor activities, but quickly fatigued. And Intermax 7 is advanced NYHA class 3, which is comfortable with meaningful activity, but limited to mild exertion. The most common cardiac transplant patients are usually class 3 and class 4 patients. Class 1 and class 2 definitely are indications for transplantation, but the outcomes of Intermax 1 and 2 are lower than Intermax 3 and 4 because of understandable reasons as these are crash and burn patients. So we really have to identify when a particular patient is in which Intermax class and when do they need to be referred for advanced heart failure therapy evaluation. So what is transplant evaluation? Assessment of functioning of non-cardiac organs is essential and a panel of investigations is performed, which includes laboratory data, um, imaging, infectious workup, end organ dysfunction evaluation, screening for malignancy, high risk behavior like um, drug abuse, candidate social support and financial counseling to ensure patient compliance post-transplant, mental health evaluation, immunocompatibility, which is ABP blood group typing, HLA tissue typing, PRA and DSA testing, which is donor specific antibodies and PRA is panel reactive antibodies. Coming to the contraindications for cardiac transplantation, advanced irreversible renal failure with creatinine of more than two without plans for concurrent renal transplant is an absolute contraindication, which is sometimes very difficult to uh, delineate from a low cardiac output patient, as I had presented to you, whose creatinine was 1.8, which got better with inotropes. But I think it is important to highlight that we have to um, rule out any uh, intrinsic kidney disease before uh, committing this patient to a heart transplant as these patients would require immunosuppressants, including calcineurin inhibitors like tacrolimus or cyclosporin, which would anyways cause renal dysfunction. So that decision is extremely important. And I think many of, um, uh, and, uh, many of the uh, you know, patients which you will see as advanced heart failure will have a creatinine, which is not normal. Advanced irreversible liver disease, especially in patients who have right-sided heart failure. Advanced irreversible pulmonary parenchymal disease, without plans for concurrent lung transplant, advanced irreversible PAH due to risk of acute right ventricular failure soon after transplant from insufficient accommodation of the donor heart to high pulmonary uh, PVR, history of solid organ or hematological malignancy within the last five years due to probability of recurrence. So this is extremely important. Uh, the duration of about five years is an absolute contraindication. Relative contraindication for cardiac transplantation are severe PVD, severe cerebral vascular disease, severe osteoporosis as they are on high dose steroids which can cause pathological fractures, severe obesity or cachexia, especially which increases risk of um, intraoperative, um, intra, uh, uh, prolonged ICU stay, bleeding and infection, acute pulmonary embolism, active infection, 
advanced stage of more than 70 years, I would call um, uh, as a relative contraindication as, you know, in my experience, we have transplanted a, a patient more than 70 years, but I think these patients have to be extremely um, well evaluated before we can say these patients will be a candidate. But I think only age alone should not uh, make us say that this patient is not a con is not a um, transplant candidate. Psychological instability, active or recent within six months substance abuse, diabetes mellitus with end organ damage, lack of social support or sufficient resources to permit ongoing access to immunosuppressive medication and frequent medical follow-up, which is an extremely important um, factor. I would probably say that this factor should be in absolute contraindication, but ISHLT and AHACC probably don't feel that. But I think if patients are not able to take medication or they are not able to follow up or get procedures done because of um, social reasons, lack of support or financial reasons, it is extremely important for us to know that we will not be able to improve the outcomes of these patients because the outcomes in transplant patients are positive only because of a very vigilant follow-up um, and vigilant um, you know, a follow-up of medications and labs. So coming very briefly to immunosuppression, as it can be a very a different talk altogether, there are three sets of medications which you primarily use in this era, which is the calcineurin inhibitors, which is tacrolimus or cyclosporin. And tacrolimus is our usually a go-to medication because that, as compared to cyclosporin, has shown improved outcomes. Anti-metabolites, which is mycophenolic acid and azathioprine. Again, mycophenolic acid is the mainstay of treatment and steroids. So as you can see here, cyclosporin was um, discovered or used in 80s. And since then, there has been an upgoing trend in survival, in median survival after heart transplantation, which has obviously been added by tacrolimus, mycophenolate, uh, multidisciplinary teams and regulatory oversights, standardized grading of rejection. So thus, um, you know, we can uh, do more surveillance. And of course, the other medications, which are cyrolimus and evrolimus, which are mTOR inhibitors. So as we have discovered more and more immunosuppressants, and as we have discovered antimicrobial prophylaxis protocols, the median survival after transplant has reached between 12 to 14 years. This data is up till 2015. This again tells us about the immunosuppressive drugs used in heart transplantation, which is the calcineurin inhibitors, cyclosporin and tacrolimus, cell cycle inhibitors, azathioprine and mycophenolate, steroids, which is methylprednisolone intraoperatively and then oral uh, prednisolone, mTOR inhibitors, rapamycin and evrolimus, which is mainly used in cardiac allograft vasculopathy, polyclonal anti-lymphocyte antibodies, which is ATG or IL-2 receptor inhibitors, which are mostly used in um, uh, induction, anti-CD20 uh, antibodies, which are used in rejection, again, proteasome inhibitors, botisomib, and terminal complement inhibitors. All these medications are usually used in either induction and the last few are in rejection, which we'll talk about. So post-transplant follow-up and management. So the common long-term complications are rejection, which is about 20% at one year. Coronary allogra cardiac allograft vasculopathy is 8% at one year. Infection, um, we have to use infective prophylaxis agents and age-appropriate vaccines. We have to look for malignancy, especially after two to three years. Diabetes mellitus, especially because of tacrolimus and steroids. Hypertension, because of calcineurin inhibitors. And renal dysfunction, primarily because of uh, calcineurin inhibitors. The risk of acute rejection is highest in the first six months after transplantation, and most centers perform routine surveillance heart biopsies during the first few months, reducing the frequency thereafter. In the current era of more effective immunosuppressive strategies, the market reduction in the risk of late cellular rejection has prompted most centers to stop routine surveillance biopsy after one to three years, although the practice varies among centers. The limitation of myocardial biopsy, including its invasiveness, expense, and considerable inter-observer variability in interpretations. Gene expression profiling of peripheral blood mononuclear cells has been investigated with an empirically derived quantitative assessment of mononuclear cell gene expression in peripheral blood specimens. Rejection of allograft is primarily a T-cell dependent presenting as acute cellular rejection. Hyperacute rejection and antibody-mediated rejection are caused by preformed antibodies against ABO blood group antigens or HLA antigens on the allograft. 
original methods to detect rejection which are signs of heart failure electrocardiographic abnormalities were insensitive and when present indicated that rejection was severe philip caves a scottish surgeon visiting stanford proposed a technique for percutaneous endomyocardial biopsy pathological assessment of myocardium was codified by margaret billingham and became the gold standard for assessment of graft rejection so as you can see here uh, the picture a shows mild cellular rejection picture b shows severe cellular rejection including myocyte necrosis this is an antibody mediated rejection where you can see infiltration in the capillaries and swelling of the capillaries and this is immunofluorescence where the complement split products are highlighted which shows again antibody mediated rejection image trial or invasive monitoring uh, attenuation through gene expression trial involving stable low risk patients more than 6 months after transplantation a gene expression profiling test which is known as allomap has demonstrated a very high negative predictive value thereby offering a reasonable alternative to routine biopsies its key limitations are a low positive predictive value in the context of its cost and lack of information on amr but definitely a good non invasive way um an alternative to a endomyocardial biopsy the detection of cell free dna of donor origin and recipient blood has been tested as a means to predict rejection and other invest other new investigations are coming up including molecular assessment of biopsy tissue exam and mrna expressions so cardiac allograft vasculopathy so here an angiogram shows severe um allograft vasculopathy which diffuse disease in all vessels um here as you can uh, uh see intermal thickening and here on ivus uh, we can see severe intermal proliferation seen on intravascular ultras uh, ultrasound which is actually a gold standard for diagnosing all allograft uh, vasculopathy and this is an histological um uh, examination of an epicardial coronary artery showing diffuse intermal uh, intermal proliferation In contrast to atherosclerotic plaques of native coronary artery disease CAV manifests as a diffuse pan arterial thickening of vessel intima CAV can affect the entire length of the epicardial vessel and typically extends to the microvasculature post transplant survival and quality of life the median survival of adult patients transplanted after the year 2000 exceeds 12 years which represents a market survival benefit compared with continued medical therapy for NYHA stage 4 patients After the acute post-operative period, the majority of patients undergoing heart transplantation do not require hospitalizations, and the functional status of 80% of heart transplant recipients is described more than 80% on the Karnofsky score, which is basically a performance scale index as an assessment tool for functional impairment. Lower the score versus the survival, higher the score, better the survival. talking about heart transplantation from global perspective so during the early 1980s the need for an organized internal forum for the exchange of um, scientific information to improve the patient outcomes provided the stimulus of creating something called ISHT which was international society of heart transplantation which became ISHLT international society of heart and lung transplantation they created a thoracic transplant um, registry and data from 500 heart transplant programs in 40 countries were accumulated number of transplant candidates placed on waiting list worldwide typically greatly outweigh the number of um available organs as you can see here worldwide here which is the north america in green others are in red and europe is in yellow and coming from um 91 92 um there was a progressive in peak in 93 then there was a decline and since 2006 there has been a grain a progressive um uptrend in 2015 uh, in the number of heart transplants So what are the future directions in heart transplantation one is the organ care system or the ex vivo um organ perfusions which basically um you know uh, give us an opportunity of getting donor heart in a preserved in a warm in a beating state and a not a cold in a cardioplegic state transmedics has formed one of the organ care systems which of course will have financial um uh, you know challenges but this gives us more number of donor organs especially when worldwide 
um, the number of recipients are more than uh, what donations are happening. Donation after circulatory death or DCD, which is procured after circulatory cessation in severely ill patients, but not brain dead patients, um, after the withdrawal of life sustaining care. This has been used in Australia and UK, and it is right now not allowed in India. ABO incompatible heart transplantation, which is mostly in um, infants because it can actually cause hyperacute rejection caused by preformed recipient serum antibodies. But however, infants do not produce these antibodies for the first six months. So this has been, um, you, uh, this has been, um, you know, kind of discussed. Um, in uh, infants for the uh, cardiac transplantation. Other things which have been investigated upon are xenotransplantation and immune tolerance. So this again is a transmedics um, OCS, which is basically um, getting a heart in, a, um, uh, in an ex vivo organ care system. So coming to management of cardiac transplant patients in the COVID era, which is a new challenge, which is the advent of COVID-19 pandemic. Data from New York and Northern Italy have demonstrated high fatality rate, which is 25 to 29% in transplant patients on immunosuppression contracting COVID-19. Greater vigilance has been advised. Moderate to severe illness, anti-metabolites, which are mycophenolate or azathioprine, are held in the short term without risk of rejection. Patients may require remdesivir. Um, uh, uh, but these are the important points, especially we are also seeing many of these patients who have received transplants and getting COVID. Coming now to heart transplantation program at KIMS, we have done heart, nine heart transplants so far, combined heart and lung transplants seven. Eight out of nine um, heart transplant patients are alive, longest for eight months. One patient had moderate cellular rejection, which was asymptomatic. She was treated and discharged and doing well. One patient developed COVID-19 requiring hospitalization and remdesivir, discharged and doing fine. And one patient developed COVID, recovered and then received heart transplant now eight months post. Three patients required IABP preoperatively for cardiogenic shock and underwent heart transplant and discharged home. So thus they were intermax one. One patient required RY post heart transplant, weaned from the right ventricular assist device and discharged home. And one patient died of suspected um, severe antibody mediated rejection in cardiogenic shock eight months post transplant. Coming to combined heart and lung transplant, six out of eight patients are alive. One patient died of bleeding postoperatively and one patient died of severe sepsis. One patient was on VA ECMO preoperatively and was transplanted doing well. And two patients got COVID preoperatively and transplanted after recovering. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you, Dr. Sonali. Any questions? Um, Sudhay Kumar, Raju, Nitin Kabra. Dr. Sonali, you have not told us about the complications and all hypertension, development of hypertension, diabetes, and development of cardiac uh, allograft vasculopathy. Because I yes. think the, the data shows almost 90% of them go on to develop hypertension. Eh? Uh, not so, sir, not ninety percent. I would say. Can go on to develop high, uh, diabetes also, and maybe up to ten to twenty percent cardiovascular uh, vasculopathy. So, sir, let me just take that slide. And that too. So, um, rejection is about twenty percent at one year. Co coronary allograft vasculopathy is about. About eight percent at one year. Mm -hmm. I have not written the percentages, but diabetes uh, mellitus is about sixty percent, and hypertension is about sixty percent too. Renal dysfunction. I was referring to almost five to eight years data in this one. I think this is a short follow up. I was referring to five to ten years data. Most of the ten years follow up that was the thing given and. So, so many times when they do develop hypertension, we can change their uh, calcineurin inhibitors from tacrolimus to cyclosporin as well. But of course, both of them cause hypertension. Exactly. Yeah. And sometimes we do change their calcineurin inhibitors to sirolimus or evrolimus, which are mTOR inhibitors. Yeah. We usually try to do it after one year. They would not cause hypertension. The problem with them is the outcomes with um, mTOR inhibitors in comparison to calcineurin inhibitors are inferior. And the secondary malignancies? Dr. Sonali. Yes, yes, sir. Dr. Yes. Sonali, the data, the percentage you are showing here on the current slide, 
Yes. It's from the literature, I suppose, not your uh, group data. No, no, this is this is not this is uh, literature, sir. Our group is what literature. I told in the last two slides. Yeah. Nitin was, uh, I think, referring to your data. Oh, sorry, you were talking uh, about our data. He, he, she doesn't. Oh, Nitin. I'm sorry. I thought you were asking about overall data. Yeah, this is the overall data, sir. Actually, yeah. what is the data? Yeah. Given, sir, our data is and fifty percent and the twenty percent is overall data. Yeah, that's overall data, yeah, sir. Just... The twenty percent is overall. Our data is only from this slide. Slide uh, the last three slides. As the last slide, the things is I think last one or two slides. Yeah. Last three slides. One, last two for heart transplant and one for combined yeah, heart. For the combined. And, yes. and I did not mention about diabetes and hypertension in them. I just wanted to give about general uh, rejection and mortality. Because the sample size will not allow you to give any yes. dependable numbers. You know? Right, right. Maybe after two, three years, you may have a better data. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Because data quality is important. Right. I think two years later, maybe I will listen to you with bigger numbers and more reliable data from your own center. You yourself yes. may improve your post-operative complication data, treatment data, etc. You may be better off. Uh, with your experience after two years. Sure. Yes, sir. I think definitely the numbers right now are low, uh, but yeah. I just wanted to kind of give an idea of what we are doing so far. And the sonal yeah. is uh, like uh, the data on uh, wall replacement and all. Are we harvesting the walls and doing homograph procedures and all at our center? And right. So, so in my also, yeah, hearts are going waste still. So, probably the walls can be harvested. And instead right. of putting a mechanical wall, we can use a homograph probably with uh, not requiring anticoagulation for uh, more than six months and that way. So are we doing wall harvesting and all in our care center there? Uh, so in heart transplant patients, are you asking specifically? I'm asking for in general because many of them may not be like for heart transplant and all. Right. Now that heart transplant program going on, are we utilizing the heart also without the transplant? So you mean in like if someone has MR severe MR, MR with dilated cardiomyopathy? MR MR with elevated dysfunction, like suppose it was wall replacement for severe AS or right. severe MS or severe MR. So, so I think they have to, uh, so the problem is that if they have such a dilated cardiomyopathy and they won't be able to, um, I think. No, like the patient is fit for uh, wall replacement, mechanical wall. So are they able to utilize these walls and all from the Jivandan program and... Uh, uh, so, in my experience, I haven't Canaver, done so far. Canaver walls are Chinese. Are institute are they using or like? I haven't done here, sir, Aunt, in my experience okay. because I just started here in December. Oh, my experience more the, has been in the US where it was for more years. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, you need you need a Nitin, you need a valve bank. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You need a valve bank, which is a big uh, enterprise. Well, we tried to do it like years back. Uh, it is not so easy. <coughs> Two good valve banks <clears throat> in this country are one all in Institute of Medical Sciences. Second one was front, uh, Frontier Lifeline Chennai. Yes, sir. <coughs> I think if there are no more questions, uh, we will close the session for today and we will come back for the program tomorrow at 10 o'clock in the morning. Okay. Dr. Nitin. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dasagar, sir. Thank you, Krishna Maji, sir. Thank you, Sudhir Kumar, sir. And thank you, K. Abraham, sir. It has been very nice interacting with you and being with you all the day. And uh, it has been a very nicely conducted program, sir. A great day. Okay, thank then. You See you tomorrow. Nitin. I'll be there, sir. I'll be there. Thank you so much, sir. Okay. Thank you, Sonali, for your presentation. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Sudhir Kumar and Dr. Krishna yes, Raju. We, I hope you will be able to participate tomorrow with the same vigor. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, sir. Yeah, okay then. Thanks. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.